Good evening, everyone. We're coming to order at 6.35. Welcome to all. Uh, we have an especially large and an especially distinguished group here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to save introductions for a little bit later, please, if I may. Um, we have um, our usual uh, monster agenda, which we'll try to go through um, in a manner both brisk and businesslike, but also open, generous, and deliberative. So um, we're very grateful in particular for our legislators being here, who will certainly help us with that second part of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, in the meantime, though, agenda revisions. Deborah, do you want to do an executive session? Uh, yes, please. We would like to add, or I would like to request the addition of an executive session for negotiations at the conclusion of the meeting, please. Everyone okay with that? Executive session at the end for negotiations. negotiations. Any other agenda revisions? Very good. Um, public comments. I should just uh, let it be known that it's our usual practice when the board has a discussion, and in particular the discussion with legislators, which will follow in a moment, that the board would have its discussion first, but would allow time for the public also to, um, to speak. So that is how um, I would propose handling communication or conversation discussion with our legislators. Are there any other matters on which the public would like to comment? If not, um, let us proceed to agenda item 2.0, discussion with Washington Central Area Legislators. Once again, we're tremendously grateful for your being here. Um, these are very challenging times for representative bodies at all levels of government, from the federal to the local, and the state in between. So um, we're very grateful to you for the work that you do. And I can guarantee that we have also no small degree of sympathy for your labors, whether, whether they're the labors of Hercules or the labors of Sisyphus, or um, however you may experience them. But thank you for being here. And um, perhaps what I should do first is have the board introduce ourselves, and then um, have you introduce yourselves. Um, Mia? Okay. I'm Mia. I'm a senior here, and I'm a student representative. My name's Towns, I'm a junior, and I'm also a student representative. Dorothy Naylor from Carlos. Uh, Chris Bay from Middlesex. Deborah Taylor, superintendent. Scott Thompson from Callis. Laura Fiesmith from East Montpelier. Lindy Johnson from East Montpelier. Giles Polskamp, Worcester. Jonas Eno Van Fleet, also from Worcester. Fiora Fisher from Berlin. And, and George. George from Berlin. <laughs> Welcome, George. Um, Janet, would you mind starting off the... Um sure. <laughs> I'll make it easy. Uh, Janet Ansel, I represent Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield, but for this purpose, I'm from Callis. I'm Anthony Polina. I serve in the Senate. I serve on Government Operations and Agriculture Committees. I live in Middlesex. I'm uh, Avram Pat. I uh, represent the Lamoille, Washington District which is four towns in three different school districts. And uh, I live in Worcester, which is uh, one of the four towns, and that's my, why I'm here at this meeting. I'm Ken Goslat. I'm a representative from uh, Berlin and Northfield. And Donna Hume, I'm uh, Ken's district mate. Kimberly Jessup, I represent Washington 5, which is Middlesex and East Montpelier. And Cummings, I'm in the Senate, and I represent all of Washington County. Thank you so much, once again. Um, what I would, uh, we have something of a four-course meal um, in terms of 
issues that, uh, that are of particularly keen interest to us. And um, I think it, you may already have heard them um, from Deborah in your contacts with her, but um, Act 166, uh, pre-K, um, getting that rationalized. Uh, Act 173, uh, that is, um, is a big one on special ed. Uh, there is also, uh, related to that, questions of dealing with um, the marked increase in uh, trauma, incidence of trauma in students in our, um, in our schools. Um, then there's the, the hardy perennial debt um, that uh, is still out there. And um, finally, uh, we understand, and, and this is a, a special interest of one of our board members, uh, that, that there may be a, a bill on dyslexia being proposed during this upcoming session. So um, that's, that's essentially the range of um, what we've decided to limit ourselves to. Although, if there are other issues that you wish to um, to talk about or ask us about, um, we're all ears, and uh, we would welcome you know your thoughts as to also what is of importance to you that we should be aware of as you start thinking about the next session. Well, I, I, I what the heck? <laughs> People. We share your concerns. No, um, to me, there's two things that come to mind. One is just money in general, or three things actually. One is money and just how, how we're doing in terms of budgets and how you folks are feeling about things. The other has to do with um, the amount of responsibilities that are putting on, being put on schools these days. Maybe that leads to the trauma question a little bit, and how not, you know, not only do you have to deal with it, but how do you deal with it, and how do you pay for deal, dealing with it? What are the added costs? The other thing that, I, that I, I was hoping to do a little bit, and I don't know whether we really have time for this tonight or not, but this group of people is much larger than it's been in the past when we've come to these meetings. And I know that we've obviously all together been through a lot of change in the last couple of years. I was going to say months, but it seems like a long time. And so I was really also just curious to hear from you folks as to how it's working out, you know, the new strategy. And I don't want to open a whole can of worms and, you know, start problems, but I, you know, I just think I'm really curious as to just how folks are feeling about the direction things are going in now that we know where we're going. So they're really questions more than more than answers. Thank you. Lindy. Well, when Anthony, when you said there's a lot more of us, there were 32 board members right. for our 1,400 kids or whatever it is. Yeah. Now there's 10 in yeah. one board versus the seven boards. So yeah. that's a, that is different. But it's there aren't more of us as far as board members. There's just more of us on one board. Right. Sure. No. Does anybody want to, how is it going? I, I'd like to know that, too. <laughs> How's it going for you? <laughs> I think we'd all like to know that. <laughs> okay. Anne. I guess just the issues you rose, and I, I you, um, we had a chairs conference the other day, and I know that on the, the chairs agenda for the ed committee, is um, the whole special ed, they did that, They're, they know we've got issues, but it'd be helpful, I think, for us to hear, you know, more directly. Um, and then um, I was told that the other body, the House, is going to be doing uh, focus work on the pre-K issue with the idea. So those two are definitely up there. Um, trauma. I know, because I serve on the Health and Welfare Committee, we've done a lot of work about trauma-informed, um, trying to get that in. We actually have put <coughs> someone into um, the Health and 
Health and Human Services Department, whose job it is to make sure that people get trained in the area of trauma. Um, it's a relatively new area, and so, you know, we're just focused, so we're, we're working on that. Um, I think I can say that we know, I know, that the schools are being asked to handle an awful lot um, that children are coming in for a number of reasons, amongst them poverty and opioids and homelessness, and the schools are being asked to kind of hold it together. Um, it does get to money because we know that the mental health agencies around here, it's probably most of the time Washington County Mental Health, um, is having trouble getting personnel. Part of that is funding, and we are the funder. Um, and we have, we've got, we've got extra money, not this past year, but the year before, trying to bring salaries up there, but we know that's an ongoing problem. Um, that you can't hire someone for a position that requires a master's degree and expect them to work for $35,000 a year. Um, not when you're looking at the student debt burden that they're carrying. So, um, and we know that if they go to the schools or the state or the hospitals, they can add a couple thousand dollars to that the day they walk in the door. So we're working on it. Um, I don't know what you're looking at at school budgets, but right now um, we did make changes to the property tax, made um, all, put all the sales tax revenue into the property tax, and took out the state transfer. Um, the report to joint fiscal this week was that the property tax is at at projection, um, so it'll depend on what you do for budgets, but we're, we're at least not anticipating a deficit in the fund at this point. So uh, um, I'm going to jump in on the, <coughs> excuse me, the trauma question. Um, I'm very interested in what the board uh, thinks we should do on it. It strikes me that this is one of those issues where we could try to be helpful and we would be the opposite of helpful. Um, and it's partly that trauma, as I understand it anyway, is really a public health issue. Um, we're really talking about sort of the social determinants of health and those kinds of things, which um, I don't, uh, you know, um, I certainly wouldn't want us to uh, try to do something uh, in connection with education, which would add more burden um, onto the schools. So I, I think, I, you know, special ed I know is an issue, and I know that there's a group of people trying to sort it out. I think it will be difficult. Uh, Pre-K is similar. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the issue on pre-K as some others are. But, um, but I was struck that you brought trauma up in the conversation, and I, I think I would really, um, I, I feel like um, as legislators, we need to be cautious. Um, there's a money, you know, we had this meeting yesterday about, or two days ago, about um, One Care and all the effort to change the way we pay for health and uh, trauma and, um, all the kinds of prevention services are all a piece of that. Um, I certainly don't want to start imposing those costs on, on the schools. Um, at the same time, I understand that uh, the uh, issues that kids deal with um, affects uh, the work that, uh, that happens here. So um, I want to jump in on the same issue, actually, um, because I guess Three years ago now, I was on the, the uh, Joint House-Senate uh, Trauma Commission, and we actually went around and talked to a lot of schools, took a lot of testimony, and came back with some recommendations, which included the bill that uh, Anne referenced that added a trauma coordinator in the Agency of Human Services, just to make sure we weren't duplicating so that we got a handle on what was available or not. 
Um, but at that time, I know that the first wave of children from the opiate epidemic were hitting kindergarten and first grade. So I'm assuming now that it's now third, fourth grade and, and on down that that huge increase in highly, you know, dysregulated, troubled kids are, are hitting. Um, I, I think one of the, um, one of the challenges the state faces is that in terms of mental health supports in the schools, um, we just sort of, you know, maybe discovered or noticed this past year that, um, you know, we, we had this huge increase in the budget for children's mental health services in the schools. Um, but it was actually, in terms of the state budget, it was a, a fictional increase because it's not state money at all. It's school money, and we come up, you know, we get involved in order to create the federal match, to create that drawdown. Um, so it's not actually any general fund budget. It's your budget and, and gaining the federal money. But what's happened across the state is that some schools have taken advantage of that for many years and have used those services. Others have not because it costs from their budget. And more are facing the, the uh, crisis, and so a lot more are seeking out and using those funds, which the legislature doesn't control because it's school board decision. And, but all of a sudden, we're seeing a big increase. And the thing that we end up facing is, and I think Janet started referencing that, we, we actually have a cap on how much Medicaid um, spending we can, uh, we can use under our agreement with the federal gov government, our global commitment, which allows us to spend money in more creative ways, um, including our whole um, payment reform effort, but has a cap because they want to ensure that allowing us to be more flexible doesn't result in us spending more. So when we get a pressure like that from um, the school side, um, that starts competing with those other uh, Medicaid pressures. So um, I'm, I'm not throwing out any um, big ideas or solutions. I'm just adding a piece of background in terms of um, some of that. I think, I think we're just going to be dealing more and more with the impact of, of trauma on mental health of our kids. and it's. Um, something we all need to address. And we are coming up against the cap. Right. We're, we're coming up against the cap. We're very, we're getting very close. And there's close. things that they're trying to maneuver in terms of what gets put in what bucket. Um, but um, if we hit that cap, we don't, we, we, then it's all general fund. We can't use Medicaid um, money for other services. So, and the um, feds yeah. are cutting, pushing down. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think Kelly uh, Bushy, who is sitting behind you, Sorry, I'm back here. is our special education so uh, person. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Kelly Bushy. I'm the director of student services. So I'm trying to stay close to Act 173 and all of the things that are happening at the state level. Um, and as all of what you just said, right? <laughs> is one of our biggest concerns with Act 173 because currently right now um, we uh, get a percentage of revenue um, for all every dollar spent within special ed and with the new funding formula under Act 173 we're going to get a block grant and so in the, the way that I understand it if somebody understands it differently please feel free to correct me is that the AOE is going to consider our spending from the last three previous <coughs> years and give us an average for the following school year. So here in Washington Central, uh, we all know, right, while our general student population is staying pretty steady, maybe gone down a little bit here and there, the overall needs of our kids continue to rise. Um, we have done lots of research in terms of looking at the needs of the kids here in our system, and much of it is contributed or attributed to the trauma that kids are coming into school with every day. Um, and so as we talk about Act 173 and this funding shift, and we're going to get this block grant that's going to meet the needs of kids throughout the course of that school year, when that money and that grant is gone, the whatever surplus that needs to be spent above and beyond that is going to need to become out of our general ed budget. And so that is a concern with Act 173. I think the intent of 173 is positive. 
right? And that we're trying to catch kids earlier before they're eligible, before they need specialized services. But I think if we're not careful and we're not involved in how the rules are being made around this, it is gonna limit um, our ability to be flexible within the system. It's my understanding there's been lots of work in, in recent weeks, in recent days at the agency level uh, we were all elated to get the memo from Secretary French this week about the funding between uh, for independent schools and that they will all be special ed costs, right? Since last June, we were sitting in uncertainty as to whether or not we were going to need to be putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into our general ed budget to support kids that need to go to independent schools. As of Monday, that is not going to happen. That will be put in the rules that they will spend alternative programs will be continued to be special ed programs um, and then the latest um, is around rulemaking right in January the special ed rules and regs are going to open there are some uh, some floundering amongst the people that are creating the rules from what I understand there's the Advisory Council that has representation from lots of people disability law project Vermont Council of special ed administrators um, They've come to some agreements around what they're proposed, proposing the, the rules should look like. Meeting with, or being met with some resistance from folks at the AOE. But again, I heard just, just this week, there's been some movement as well, um, where people are starting to come together and to come to some consensus. It's my understanding the State Board of Ed has asked the Agency of Education to sit with this advisory panel and to come to the State Board with one set one draft set of rules um, but that is being that is a challenging task at this point in time so that's thank, thank you, you Kelly. thank you uh, the other topic may i switch gears to okay sure. excellent just one moment it was mentioned that we have some ongoing concerns about act 166 which we are um, you know in a sense very happy about the fact that we are able to provide uh, education to our preschool students both within our schools as we've been doing for some time and also through highly qualified pre-k programs which uh, many of our students attend uh, for which we provide payment for up to 10 hours per week uh, however there are some challenges with the law that we really need to address and i wanted to highlight a couple of those and then i'd be happy to send you this in a more detailed fashion so that you can look it over and get back to us with any clarifications that are needed. So the first concern is that the um, universal pre-K, which is what we call Act 166, um, really should benefit all students. And uh, regardless of their family income or situation, equity is very important to us here in Washington Central. And um, unless one has transportation, um, and uh, there are no opportunities for people to access the pre-K program that is outside of school. And just to be clear, we do provide transportation for our preschool students, so I'm only speaking of those who choose to go to an outside provider. Um, we also would like to strongly recommend, and I don't know if any of you remember, but since this act was originally proposed, I think I've testified three or four times myself to various committees to let you know how important it is that a single lead agency take on preschool here in Vermont. We currently work with both the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Education. We have duplicate regulations. That might not seem like something that's very important, but it, it truly is a hindrance uh, because we're asked to per really as look at our child care regulations, which don't necessarily apply to school settings, along with the Agency of Education regulations. So there's duplicate criminal background checks, for example. Um, there's also duplicate requirements for training. Uh, I could go on and on, but again, I'll write you a note about this in more detail. Uh, the other area of concern is that the bill is silent around special education. And we are, of course, favoring early intervention, and we uh, have opportunities available in our schools when our students attend our home-based, home school-based preschool programs to provide special education services. However, there's no direction or funding mechanism available for students who may be enrolled in a private preschool 
who are identified with special education needs. And that's an area we really, again, could dialogue about for some time. Um, let's see. I think that's enough for now, because I don't want to take up all our time on preschool, but I will send you a note with more detailed information. As you can see, there's some major areas that we really need to, to address. But I did want to argue, at least on behalf of um, the school administration uh, here in the district, that we strongly support early intervention and we would not be interested in a repeal of this law. We just need to make refinements and amendments that will make it more uh, user-friendly, if you will, and also serve more children, especially our most needy children from families that may be in poverty, as well as those with special needs. Are there questions about that quick overview on concerns about 166? Okay. I will I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask one that I found sure. probably hard to answer, but you're, you're right that part of the problem is that we've got two agencies that are responsible for this. Which one would you give it to? <laughs> I think the fact that preschool is offered in the public schools and in most schools in the state of Vermont right now it makes sense to have at least those programs that are school-based to be overseen by the agency of education. Those that are overseen, uh, that are occurring within a child care center, it might make sense to have those overseen by the agency of human services as a thought. But there are many ways of looking at that which we could explore. I guess I'd ask you to talk a little bit more about what you, I think what I heard you say was that if they're going to a school-based program and they have special needs that can be dealt with differently or more comprehensively than if they're in a private center. Is that, am I saying that right? Correct. There's no provision in the law at all. It's just silent on the provision of special education for students that are not in our school programs. And um, there are different ways that districts have chosen to address that. Some provide the services off-site at that location. Others invite the students to come, but there again, it's an access issue. If the parent can transport the children to our school programs, they have about those services available to them. But there is really the issue of cost, of course, arises when we're uh, required to provide services to as many as 50 to 75 children that are not, or a proportion of those that are in special ed that are not currently enrolled in our schools. So it's cost and uh, accessibility, sure. those types of things. This is the student who is going to a child care, mm -hmm. qualified child care, gets their pre-school education there, but they may not be trained or have the ability mm -hmm. to do the special ed. Parents are working somewhere, so they don't have the ability to come home and transport the child to the school for the special ed services. But you don't provide the day-long child care services? No, actually we do. You we do. have a program That's called I Community thought. Connections, so if a parent were to choose to enroll their, their preschool age child in our elementary schools, there are, I think in 90% of the cases, there's pre and post child care. It's a little yeah. bit variability okay, so that is an for preschool. So the alternative for us is that a child could stay with us for a full day. And we do provide transportation. Uh, but not all school systems provide that. Uh, it is, we're, we've actually offered the child care as a, uh, to complement our preschool programs for many years, oh, I'd say maybe 16 or 17 years here in our district. So, but not all of our parents have those opportunities. I like to think globally when we talk about And I know issues. that the child cares are struggling because the cost for providing service to a three-year-old is less just because of the mandated staffing ratios. Right. And they have offset the cost of infant care with the preschool care, and now the more students that lose to the school system, the more difficulty they're having staying open because people can't afford the actual cost of providing care to infants. So 
quality. There's definitely a shortage. We have a problem. There's a shortage of adequate quality <coughs> child care. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is, and there are plans. We did a lot in health and welfare last year. The state has some major plans for at least reducing the cost to families, and these are families with state subsidy, but it would be a major, um, we're just working on, we came up with a significant amount of funding to do the infrastructure work that needs mm -hmm. to happen this year. And hopefully by next year, we'll have some help for both the child care and the families right. um, in the funding area, but that doesn't solve there's just, there's just a couple of problems that, if we corrected, I think would help our children with access as well, uh, and our families with access. But I'd be more than happy to provide you with more details yeah. on that topic. Here. Okay. And then we had another item, Scott, I think, which was um, a question of the legislation for dyslexia. Would you like me to share these? Um, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Deborah. Sure. Uh, Deborah is just going to um, give you a souvenir of, uh, of your visit with us today. It's, um, it's a letter from one of our fellow board members who is on the road and couldn't be here. But um, she notes in the letter that Vermont is one of seven states left in the U.S. that have no law related to the specific needs of dyslexic students. And she notes there's apparently a bill, a um, numbered bill, H406, that uh, to require that students in public schools be screened for dyslexia and that teachers receive training concerning dyslexia. I just wanted to be clear, um, the, the board as a whole has not reviewed this or come to a position on this. We just want to make sure on behalf of our colleague that you're aware of her interest. So um, this, this is not coming with our official imprimatur or whatever. Curious. Oh, it doesn't from. have her name on it. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. They should have her name. I think it, um, yeah. It, it doesn't all. show on our oh, yeah. It's um, Mary Lynn Strachan. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Mary Lynn Strachan. I think it's oh, okay. Well, if one of those two dyslectic brothers, I'll certainly find this interesting. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'll forward you a copy with the signature on it with the other That's fine. I just was curious. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. So, um, we still haven't answered Anthony's question. And then, are we going to talk about that? Um, do we need to explain to you about the debt issue in Washington Central? Have, no. <laughs> what debt issue? I've heard about it. I think we may have heard about it. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, it, it's all, basically all you need to know is that it may be buried, but it's not dead. So. I mean, it hasn't it's magically been solved. It hasn't magically been solved, no. No. So Chris, is, is, there, is there any hope for solving it through the legislature? Mary, I'm, and, and I'm quite serious. Is any possibility that the legislature will take this up uh, in, in relation to Act 46 to try and uh, ease the, I mean, it's a tense and a divisive issue uh, because we have two towns with no debt, three towns with significant debt, <coughs> But everyone shares in the debt now, uh, and it's a it's a difficult problem. Is there any chance of addressing it through the legislative action? We have to look at the, the, the uh, committee no, members. I'm looking, who are, at, I'm looking yeah. at Janet. I know but, Janet right. and I have put in well at least two bills trying to deal with the issue. Right. I, I, I introduced I know you've done at least a couple board. bills in the House, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, was able to get at least a sort of general agreement from House Education that they would be supportive, but only if the Senate um, sort of, uh, because the bill, the vehicle for it at that point was in a, in a conference committee, um, that it, some proposal needed to come from the Senate. And it's, um, Anyway, didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's, it's been frustrating. What you would like us 
to do and then we can so if we have a bill draft. Came up with a specific proposal we should forward it to um janet and to you Ann? yeah um actually revenue bill yeah i mean both of us can put it in we have a december 1st drafting deadline mm -hmm. so do we now yeah you used yeah, to be do now. a lot looser yeah. than we are. Yeah. But oh, we have just, uh, December 2nd. I'm just oh, being reminded for you. Oh, maybe the first of the Sunday. Yeah. But we are coming up against the deadline. So if you okay. let us know how you would like to have it solved, yeah. we can. I, I do, because I, a specific I, idea helps, and then it right, may right. work from there, but it starts something. And, and I really want to underscore that. I think one of the difficulties was that there wasn't consensus um, among the towns um, for a solution. And so um, the, the, there um, wasn't a lot of enthusiasm on the part of representatives of other communities that have gone through a merger um, to do anything, but it, that w it was easy for them to say no when we didn't have a consensus proposal. So a, a proposal from the board where there's general agreement would carry some weight. Um, I think without that, it, it's, you know, we're... Um, I, d I think we came as close as we might have come last year, and we didn't make it. So. Yeah. yeah, we talked briefly about supporting your proposal from last year, but we don't have a consensus yet as a as a board on what to do. I, I didn't hear the first that part. That we talked briefly about yeah. supporting your proposal. Now that we are all unified, it makes sense to not try to reinvent the wheel, but try to go back to your proposal and get behind that. Or, or it, I mean, there may be better ideas. I was mm -hmm. coming up with my ideas sort of out of whole cloth because I didn't, yeah. I didn't Jane, have. Bill, what's that? Bill number? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't remember the bill numbers. I could, I could get them for you. Um, but they, they were going to end up getting folded into other bills. So um, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Oh, I think if you yeah, type I think in, in the general, subject, it'll. Yeah. On the, on the website, you can find it. But I, but there was a there was a proposal that I worked with Andy Perschlick on, um, that was sort of the kind of last best offer, if you will, um, and th that doesn't have a bill number. Um, I can get the language, but um, but again, if the board has a better idea or a different idea where there can be some agreement among uh, board members, that uh, that's really what we need to work with. Um, this really isn't something I should be uh, dreaming up, um, although the input of the folks here makes a difference because you don't want to come up with this great idea that doesn't get passed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also the political reality. Um, but I, I know I'm, I'm willing to try to help. Um, I assume um, everyone here is also willing to. In, in terms of Anthony's question, um, I think we're still finding our way. Um, we're getting used to working together. I think on whole we do pretty well. We don't sing Kim Bai at the end of every meeting. Um, <laughs> but I think on whole we're, we're getting along and moving forward. I think the uh, big challenge will be the budget this year because it's going to be the first time we have a unified budget as opposed to uh, discrete budgets that were just added together. Uh, so we'll see. But I think a lot of uh, work in good faith with each other, I think. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. I agree. Um, Kimberly. Um, I can flag one issue uh, that has come up um, via constituent calls uh, in the last month or so. Actually, there's been three. But uh, for what it's worth, I'll put them out there. One of them uh, concerns the transition to proficiency. And what I typically am hearing is that most folks are very supportive of the theory. And where they are struggling uh, is with the implementation. And I would note that Representative Gosland and I, in fact, were at another event uh, with the governor. And one of the questions that came from the press corps was how's implementation of proficiency going across the state? And the answer was uneven. 
And I think there's been some really good work uh, done around the state about different models. I think there's been some very good work here in the school in terms of student input, uh, in terms of reporting, in terms of cooperation with teachers. And I guess the plug that I would put in is that the board hear from students and hear from teachers. And I think it's just coming into the focus because the class of 2020 is the first class that will be graduating. And I am hearing from some students who from, well, from the parents of students who are all of a sudden realizing that when they're going to fill out the common application or something else and they're s struggling with the merit-based aid and the calculation of GPAs. And I won't get all into the, the weeds on this, but I think it is something that we have this first class coming and there have been, um, I think, um, a lot of improvements and a lot of areas identified. And I don't know how familiar the board is with some of the good work being done and where some of the outstanding issues may be, but I would point to that as a, another issue on deck. Um, and then okay. if you want me to throw out just a couple other random ones, um, I have had suggestions come to me. Uh, could we consider uh, doing driver's education during the summer months? Uh, that there's a, a often a waiting list, and would that waiting list be sufficient to create a cohort that could uh, take on this task during the summer, and that there are some families who can afford the extra money to go to private uh, resources for driver's ed, but not everybody can. And then finally, the last thing I would just throw that I'm also hearing a bit about is uh, elementary uh, school level language instruction, that there, um, I don't know where that currently stands across all the elementary schools, but um, I don't believe it's uniform, and I don't know, now that you're a unif unified board, whether that allows you to do some of the things that were discussed around language and other thing, uh, issues that might be attractive to various constituencies. So I would just pop those out there as things that I'm hearing for what it's worth. Th thanks so much. Um, it's really a remarkable coincidence, or not, that you uh, raised proficiency-based uh, graduation requirements because the very next agenda item after this will be, will feature, um, I, I believe, Stephen Bellinger pate and Jen Miller-Arsenault actually getting into the weeds um, a little bit. So on precisely that subject. So, um, and you're welcome to stay. Uh, all of you, of course, are welcome to stay. Um, Anthony, did I, did I notice, were you about to um, say something? No, yeah, no. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, board members, uh, anything else before we open to the public? <laughs> okay. Um, I, with your permission, I'd uh, just invite members of the public, if, um, if you have questions or anything that you'd like to mention to our legislators. Uh, Mac? Uh, thank you. I'm Matt Gardner Morse from Callis, and um, I'm a parent of uh, three dyslexic kids. And uh, I just wanted to read it, something that I've written up here. Around fourth grade is when that crucial shift from learning to read to reading to learn occurs. Yet according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, only 30% of our fourth graders are proficient at reading. This means that 63% are not proficient at reading. This also marks the 17th year of declining reading scores. I believe our students are as bright as past students. Our teachers are as good as past teachers. So why are our scores declining? Under Vermont's current wait to fail special education rules, of those 63% of fourth grade students who are not proficient at reading, only the students who are at least two grades behind in reading qualify for any support or assistance with their reading. Dr. Joe Torgerson states in his article, Catch Them Before They Fall, with one of our most compelling findings in our recent research, reading research is that children who get off to a poor start in reading rarely catch up. As several studies have now documented, the poor first grade reader almost invariably continues to be a poor reader. 
and the consequence of a slow starting reading becomes monumental as they accumulate exponentially over time. Dr. Sally Sawich states in Overcoming Dyslexia, the human brain is resilient, but there is no question that early intervention and treatment bring about more positive change at a faster pace than an intervention provided to an older child. The sooner a diagnosis is made, the quicker your child can get help, and the more likely you are to prevent secondary blows to her self-esteem. Waiting rarely works and has serious consequence. Yet Vermont's wait to fail model flies into the face of this research. While verbal language is innate, reading is not. What is the best way to teach reading? Neuroscience research shows that teaching the 44 unique phonemes or sounds in, in the English language in a direct and systematic way is the best way to teach reading to everyone. Unfortunately, very few primary school teachers know these phonemes. How can these teacher, teachers teach these sounds if they do not know them? Why don't teachers know these phonemes? Because they are never exposed to them in their teacher training. Our state colleges and universities are not training our new teachers using the latest research and best practices. The state needs to work with Vermont's colleges and universities to, to include phonemic awareness in new primary school teacher training and include phonemic awareness on teachers' licensure tests. To model these phonemes as the current curriculum does is not effective instruction for many children. These phonemes need to be taught in a direct and systematic way. The Agency of Education could and should be vetting curriculums to ensure that phonemes are taught with a direct and systematic method. Finally, consider dyslexic students who could benefit from computer technology. Software such as spelling aids, word prediction, speech to text, and text to speech will support the education and life skills when, import, when appropriate instruction and guidance are provided. Students should be provided with these up-to-date software technology. House Bill 406 does include the early identification of students with reading difficulties, suggests early evaluation of these students, and proposes teacher continuing education courses and reading methods. In addition, it should also address changing Vermont's wait to fail special education rules, including phonemic awareness of new primary school teacher training, including phonemic awareness on teacher licensure tests, better vetting of quote, research, unquote, based curriculums to be sure that phonemes are taught with a direct and systematic method and providing assistive technology for students. I hope you will help improve and pass House Bill 406. Please let me know if I can be of further assistance as this bill moves forward, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mac. Thank you. Um, other members of the public who would like to uh, ask a question or say something? Um, specifically to our legislators. I don't see uh, anyone. Um, Can I, if, in that case, I just want to ask this fellow. You mentioned this bill, H406, or what have you. Yes. Was there any movement on it last year no. that you're aware? So far, no. You just got okay. sent to committee and just sat there? Yes. I don't know who introduced it. I said pick up the news for Yes. Seems important. Um, before we set you free, um, it is, uh, or set you free to stay if you prefer, um, is there anything else that, um, that you think we should know that, um, that's imp going to be important to you in the upcoming session where, it's hard for me to imagine, but where we might possibly be helpful or at least not a hindrance? I, I really appreciate having this meeting now I rather than during a blizzard. During a blizzard. And during a blizzard when basically we've made most of the decisions. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. good going in terms of timing. That's a good start. Um, and, uh, you know, I know I'm speaking for everybody. Please keep in touch with us. Let us know. And if there are, you know, issues around the things that we've been talking about or other things, um, you know, it's easy to, I think it's fairly easy to get in touch with us, and we want you to do that. Yes. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just going to mention related to that. If you do go forward with something on the debt issue, if you come up with an idea, as we talked about, it doesn't have to be all dotted I's and yeah. cross T's. It needs to be a concept that could be given to the legislative lawyers to draft a bill 
which then goes to changes, as you all know. Nothing comes out the way it started. But it would also be important if we go if we go that route that you folks do what you can to communicate with other school boards who might be interested in similar moving forward in the system together. Because you know, le legislators will hear from us, but we're there all the time. They really will need to hear from you folks and from others who are in similar situations. So you have to do a little bit of outside organizing and agitating to make sure that people get into the state house to plead their case. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. Yeah. I just want to uh, echo something that uh, the janitor said, which is that to the extent without making a whole lot of work that you can uh, re find ways and remember to, to communicate with, with us, especially when the, the, the whole board has discussed something and and is close to consensus on, uh, on an issue. For someone like me, when, we're, when you're in the House, you're on one committee. And, uh, and so I've, I haven't said anything because I'm listening to everyone here and I'm listening to some of the legislators who have worked on, on, on some of these issues. Um, I, and I, I work on completely different issues in, in, locked in our little committee rooms. So it really helps um, uh, to not, and we, we all struggle to find out what's happening in the other committees, uh, uh, what people are working on, what, what things are likely to come out of the Education Committee or the, or the Ways and Means Committee or, or, or whatever. So it really helps uh, for some occasional uh, communication that when, when, it, when uh, legislation uh, is needed or I think Janet said at the beginning, or specifically maybe when it's not needed. Uh, sometimes it's best for us to stay out of it, and, and that's good to hear as well. Thanks. And, and Ken, I don't know if, um, if there's anything, any message that you have for us. Just yeah. send me your concerns. I just, um, you just really stated, I mean, ju judiciary, and uh, that's pretty full bolt. And uh, I, I need to hear the concerns, and then I can act on them, or I can certainly uh, do diligence and, and look into to what's going on. The, um, the money issue, I'm well aware of that. I understand it. Or I don't understand. That's a different story. Uh, I hear your concern. And uh, being uh, this is my first year uh, in the House, um, um, I hear your concerns. Yeah, thank you very much. And they're justified. Thanks. So, okay. thank you for the invite, by the way. Oh, uh, and and thank all of you, to for for coming. Um, I well, we thank I mean, you folks do all the scrunt work all the time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we don't, you people, we're not necessarily special because of what we're doing. I mean, what you're doing is really, really important and really close to the community, and I really appreciate. I think we all really appreciate that a lot. Um, it's not it, an easy thing you're taking on. It's very kind of you to say, but um, I have been over there on occasion, and I've seen what you do, <laughs> and I don't know how you do it. <laughs> it takes a certain um, superhuman stamina, I would say, to be able to um, make it through what you have to go through. So, um, <laughs> so thank you very much. And, and you're welcome to stay for as long as, as you'd like. Or I, I know you have busy lives, so um, I, of course you don't need to. And Oh, oh I'm no, sorry. I, Cindy. I didn't jump up quickly enough, perhaps. Um, I'm Cindy Gardner-Morse. I live in Calais. I just wanted to reiterate those statistics, because I think you went over them last month, when, or last meeting, when I wasn't able to come. But those scores from the National Assessment of Education, um, that only 37% of fourth graders are proficient, which means that 63% are not proficient. If you picture those children, that's, um, that's uh, I had this already to say, three children standing there that are not reading proficiently when six children beside of them are, no, I said that backwards. It's just not enough children reading proficiently. And that's the goal of our school system. We really need to address this better. And this idea that it's been going on for 17 years, and our math scores weren't terrific either. I think we really need to look at what we're doing in our schools and do some direct education and direct instruction. So I just wanted to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, any last words? Or uh, otherwise, 
You'll have to forever hold your peace. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you. All of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very good. Uh, moving along. Uh, you got <laughs> no. Always hot. It's always too warm. <laughs> based graduation requirements, or PBGRs, and I'm going to focus on the sort of pre-K through graduation systems level work. Stephen's going to talk primarily about uh, the specific work that we've been doing at U32. We anticipate some questions, and we're prepared to answer them. We think that some of the earliest part of this presentation will probably answer some questions, so we're going to go ahead and, and do that. We we'll take questions a little later. If you have a clarifying question, though, and you need to ask it, by all means, um, ask it when you're ready to do that. So uh, why is this work important? So um, we have our mission in Washington Central Unified Union School District. And our mission statement reads, WCUUSD exists to nurture and inspire in all students the passion creativity and power to contribute to their local and global communities. We believe it is our professional responsibility and our moral obligation to make sure that kids are prepared for post-secondary success. And our student learning outcomes and our expectations regarding proficiency-based graduation requirements are a manifestation of what we think kids need to know and be able to do in order to be prepared for post-secondary success. 
the world, as you know, is changing frequently, and we can't even envision some of the work that our kids are going to do in the years to come. So we want to make sure that we're laying a solid foundation for them so that they can tackle challenges that we can't even foresee yet. Uh, one of the um, educator blogs that I read is a, a, by a man named George Koros. He is, does work on innovation in schools and the innovator's mindset. And there was just a blog post today, a quote on his site, um, by a colleague of his named A.J. Giuliani. And uh, he wrote, our job is not to prepare students for something. Our job is to help students prepare themselves for anything. And that quote, as I was thinking about tonight, really resonated. <laughs> so some, some of you might even wonder, this might be new, what is a proficiency-based learning system? This is a definition that comes from the glossary of education reform. And it's a glossary that is um, written really so that uh, lay folks can understand it. So uh, journalists, parents, community members. And we're really talking not just about uh, grading, or scoring, we're really talking about pillars of a, of a learning system. So curriculum, instruction, assessment, grading, and reporting. In Washington Central, because of this shift, we've also changed our lexicon a little bit. So we talk a lot more about scoring than we do about grading. But essentially, in a proficiency-based system, achievement becomes the constant, and it's time and place that become the variables. But our expectations for students are universally high, and we will do whatever it takes to ensure that they meet those expectations. We also want to remind you that we didn't just conjure this up at U32 or decide that this needed to happen in Washington Central, that this work is really grounded in a statewide context as well. So. Um, the Flexible Pathways legislation, Act 77, passed in July, or went into effect in July 2013. Um, the Vermont Ed Education Quality Standards in April of 2014 state that all students beginning with this year's current senior class, the class of 2020, need to graduate under a proficiency-based learning system. Our board, formerly the Washington Central Supervisory Union Full Board, uh, adopted our student learning outcomes um, as a full board back in 2016. And this new board, as we've been looking at our policies um, to make sure that they are <coughs> aligned with our needs, uh, adopted our proficiency-based graduation policy um, as a board of directors back in June. So we have been doing this work for a really long time. And in fact, we began the work of articulating what our kids needed to need to know and be able to do from pre-K through graduation before Act 77 and the Ed Quality Standards were even revised. We started articulating that work in about July, August of 2012. And for those of you who were here and in the system back then, at that point in time, we called that our non-negotiables, right? It was our attempt to articulate in alignment with national standards our guaranteed and viable curriculum. And that work has gone through some iterations over the years and some refinements. Right now, we have articulated in alignment with these student learning outcomes our standards and performance indicators um, that clearly articulate what kids need to know and be able to do in each grade level or grade level cluster in each of these student learning outcome areas. So literacy, mathematics, global citizenship, science, artistic expression, financial literacy, PE and health, and the transferable skills. We've also, you know, I said earlier that the system needs to be more responsive to students' needs. We know that students don't all learn at the same time, in the same pace, in the same way. So we've been working hard to create some more flexibility in our schedules. The um, elementary principals, in conjunction with the teachers, have all worked really hard to create designated intervention blocks in their schedules so that kids are getting supplemental um, instruction and we're not taking away from one thing to um, to meet a need someplace else. This is a co-presentation, and I said Stephen was going to talk about some of the specifics at U32, so I'm going to pass it on to him to do that. Yeah, and so similar to the elementary schools here at U32, um, we implemented um, some intervention blocks, but we called them different things, of course. So we have a callback uh, that was introduced uh, several years ago. In fact, I think it was my first year here, so that's six years ago now. 
that, uh, that that was introduced. And, uh, and we're now actually moving to version two of that, where we've expanded the amount of time that students can uh, meet with a teacher or a teacher can call back students. And so that's one of the things we did. But we also have intervention blocks here at U32 as well. And so a student who struggles with reading or math could very well end up in what we call a reading strategies or math strategies program, um, particularly at the middle school level. Um, and so we try to, uh, to not only um, assist them in gaining those skills they need in reading, uh, we add that to their current curriculum. So they already spend time in core, and then they have time um, in those classes as well to improve their, their skills. Now the nice thing about it, in the old system of intervention, kids typically got, were put into a class that would last all year long. Um, what we've tried to do is at least break it into quarters. And so if a student, um, a student moves to the level where they can um, do the work independently or, or more independently, um, we can move them out of the intervention class at any one of the quarter breaks um, so that they're not, they're not there forever. Vice versa, if a student starts to struggle and show need, we can place them into the intervention class at the quarters as well. And so uh, while it's not 100% flexibility, it certainly is a way for us to start looking at what can we help. And, and that's really at the middle school level. At the high school level, we, uh, while we still have some of the reading support, uh, lit, uh, literacy support uh, there, we also have uh, what we call math labs. And that's in addition to their math classroom to try to increase their skill level at, at that point in time. I think an interesting point that was brought up earlier about by fourth grade um, uh, intervening in that, uh, we certainly know that the more interventions that are done at the elementary level, the fewer interventions that we would have to do at U32 um, overall. And so that's a conversation that we've had back and forth between U32 and the elementary schools long before we were one unified district. We were having these conversations about, you know, what are the interventions and what can we do that's, that's common, what's common practices that we can do. So that when kids come to U32, um, they've heard a similar thing depending on which um, elementary school they went to. So that alignment of our SLOs also is, a, is an attempt to align our uh, interventions as well uh, when we do that. We also at U32 have expanded our program of study. So you remember there were two things that were mentioned in the, in the previous slide, Act 77 and the educational quality standards. Those two things together have grown into the proficiency system. But Act 77 was around personalized learning plans and multiple pathways um, of learning. And so that was a vehicle to get to the educational quality standards and, and having kids meet those. Um, so at U32, we have multiple pathways, um, or we feel like we have multiple pathways, and certainly can develop more. But those are programs like our pilot program, our branching out program. Um, we have students who take online courses. We have kids who do early college. So there are other things that, that students can do um, at U32 that are not just the traditional classroom uh, setting. And so those are all in response to both of those things, Act 77 and the Educational Quality Standards. So what we want them to learn, the Educational Quality Standards, and how we're going to help them get there. And we'll talk a little bit more about the personalized learning plans as we get a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you this one. Go for so it. So we've also engaged in a lot of professional learning opportunities for our teachers. This is something that we've been doing, again, predating all of this work, 2013-2014. Uh, but we have done a lot of work. Uh, when I first came on board as the early education coordinator, we had a big emphasis on literacy, making sure that, especially at the elementary schools, we did understand all of those components of a comprehensive and balanced literacy program. We've been doing a lot of work in mathematics in recent years as well. Um, we know that our scores uh, have room for improvement, to say the least. Around this work in particular, we've been doing some work on project-based learning as a way to ensure that we're meeting kids' needs and are engaging students. We, last year at U32, did a lot, of, a lot of work with the Great Schools Partnership. They provided technical assistance as we are working with teachers primarily to implement uh, the proficiency-based learning system. And each summer, our teachers after school, um, after the school year ends, have the opportunity to join us in what we've called curriculum camp. And, um, and the focus most recently, once we've articulated our standards and our performance indicators for kids, we really wanted to build learning scales to really think about what that projection was, what that pro or what the progression was from just beginning to know something to actually uh, achieving proficiency or even exceeding our expectations so that we can give specific actionable feedback to students. 
So those have been areas of focus for professional development recently related to ultimately the proficiency-based graduation requirements. Yeah, and in response to, you know, currently, the class of 2020, they're applying for college. As of November 1st, many of them put in applications for the early uh, decision, early action uh, process. And so last year, we knew that our school profile, which is what colleges see about what is U32, what do we have, uh, we took our profile to the college recruiters. So we actually, uh, last year, invited them to dinner when they were here for one of our uh, college nights. And so we had a large group of them. We handed them our draft of it, and we said, okay, does this make sense? Do you see who our students would be? What suggestions would you have? How can we look at this so that when you get an application from U32 and you get our profile, you're able to look at that and say, okay, I understand what they're communicating through their transcripts or about their students and what courses they take and all of that. And so we vetted that through them and, and um, there's a link to our school profile that's on our website. Um, and that's going out to the colleges to explain who we are and how we do things. Um, and then we also, um, last year, really worked on improving our course recommendation process uh, to make sure in a proficiency system, we have to make sure that kids have access to the courses or the work that they need to be able to graduate. And so we spent a lot more time last year talking about which courses do kids need to take in their junior and senior years particularly uh, to make sure that they meet our proficiencies or have the opportunity to meet our proficiencies um, in the work that they do. And so um, used to be um, if you took English one, you took English two. Right? And that was real simple because then I just took English 3 and then, I, and then maybe, maybe I got real fancy and I took um, the, um, the world authors or I took the, um, the uh, I'm, I'm really, I should know this, right? Um, so the, the lit class, the, the other lit class. Um, so, so there was a lot of, of, of kind of, well, if you're this kid, you should go to this class and if you're this kid, you should go to this one. Um, but really, that doesn't take into account student interest as much as it took into account where we thought a student was. Now we look at the kid and we say, okay, what proficiencies do you need? Here are the courses available to you that can help meet those proficiencies. Which one are you interested in? Where would you like to go? Where would you like to learn most? And so, so they're able to do that. We also found, I mean, in our course recommendation process, because we had to look back at where kids were, we found gaps. We found uh, three very significant gaps in our curriculum. One of them was statistics and probability. There just weren't, weren't enough opportunities for our kids to demonstrate their learning in that. We found that um, in economics, which is more in our global citizenship uh, standard, we found that economics was given short shrift and our kids were not exposed to it as much as they should be. And we found that engineering in our science uh, standards was one that they did not have enough access to. What does that mean? That means you need to revise your courses, not tell the kids that they don't need to learn something. And so we've, we've been revising our courses to meet those needs um, and, and to make sure that our kids have more opportunities to do those. And so. Good evening. I'd like to thank all the parents for coming this evening. It is 7.45 so, and we do want to allow our teachers to go home and get a good night's sleep so they can come back tomorrow morning. So please wrap up the conferences and drive safely. Okay, so those of you who aren't aware, we have parent-teacher conferences going on today as well. I know some of you knew that because you were here. Um, and so that um, the course recommendation process also led to a course creation process as well. What were the courses that we needed that would give kids more opportunities to, to do the work that they needed to do? And, um, and then I already mentioned the callback process uh, where we, we increased the time actually this year so students have more time. Uh, to be able to work with teachers to bolster some of their proficiency work. And so I know that that's happening specifically in geometry. If a student hadn't demonstrated full proficiency in geometry, uh, they might need just one or two things and they're using their callback time this year to be able to, to demonstrate that, uh, that learning and not have to retake the entire course, which is something that might have happened in the past if you did not score the appropriate grade. Talk also about the group that meets with you during the Oh, yes. Oh, and then I also have uh, my, uh, that's what that one is, right? Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, so I also have a group of students who have been, uh, who've been vocal about what works and what doesn't work. And they've been uh, meeting with me on uh, Thursdays and now Tuesdays. And it's actually grown um, into a, uh, a student organization uh, called Youth and Adults Transforming Schools Together, which is a more uh, regional uh, grouping of students. And, uh, and I've had a variety of students who have come to that and who have been a part of that and said, hey, here's, here's what's working and what's not. 
Um, we have revised some of our personalized learning plan process as a result of those students. Um, they were actually looked at the school profile as well. And so they've been a key part of just getting feedback from them on a regular basis. And I, I just, I mean, just in a personal note on that, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me. And I, I would say that because even two of them are here uh, today. Uh, but, but they really have been extremely valuable in bringing to um, myself and eventually the teachers um, what is working and what is not. And so it's been, they've been going on now for, it's been almost two years that we've been meeting. So it's been very helpful. Okay, good. All right. So now, somebody asked, what do the students think about this? So we actually asked them two questions, um, and I have a short little video of just a couple of kiddos, um, but certainly we're going to see what they said. So we're going to get to the video. Hopefully it works. Yes, it Hold on. Yep. I'm going to pause. So if you didn't hear that last, reassess on quizzes and work. Um, so that was just four of our students. I um, feel like it captured a few of the ideas. And then the second question was, what would make the proficiency-based system work better for you? And so. Um, I think what needs to make it a lot better would be knowing exactly what is really important and how like, the uh, things you're going to need to graduate and what classes you can use to take to get those proficiencies and stuff like that. Because I think that's a little confusing right now. For me, the most basic thing I can go through is just more detail than what you could for because, you know, I think it's you know, too wide a range to be in the B zone or the four zone. I think there's like a lot more specific things you can, just, you know, increments and just putting, you know, someone could do something, you know, that deserves like a higher grade than someone else. They can fit one, two, three, and there's just not much distinction between what's the actual variety that exists there. So, yeah, I think a little more specific would be so. Um, I think that one thing that could make the proficiency-based system work better for me um, is some consistency across the board for all teachers. I think that um, some teachers do a really good job of um, implementing proficiency in the classroom, but there's a lot of confusion around it, and I think it makes it hard to go from class to class with a different system. Like, you could be like so close to being efficient, but you're still in like a two category. Like, there have been like many times I've gotten like a two plus just because like I'm missing like a small thing and I can't reassess on it because you know like I said it's like project based and like sometimes like to build up to that project you have to put those like stepping stones but when that's like averaged out like sometimes it can hurt the final um, grade and like I just wish there was like a larger scale. Um, and I think that would also work better for GPAs too. Um, yeah. Yeah, 
so we um, we also were asking our teachers about uh, their practice as well. So we want to make sure, uh, again, folks asked, what, what do teachers think about this? We want to make sure that we share some of the teacher voices with you and then uh, just maybe pause and see what questions you have at this point and then we'll talk about some more specifics and share the data of, of the class of 2020 and the class of 2021 with you. The implementation of proficiency-based learning has impacted my teaching in a way that I now can hold students accountable directly for the content that I'm teaching um, instead of their work habits combined with the content. And so it's easier for me to say whether or not a student has met a sort of literacy requirement um, because I've seen their progression towards that standard and it's not being clouded by their ability to turn and work on time or other transferable skills that we've now suffered with. Without, without a doubt, I feel like it's made everything so much more clear, both for me uh, and for the kids. So it provided just a ton of clarity in all of my classes. Um, well, the first thing I think about immediately is the way that kids use the library independently to do their own research the way I collaborate with teachers um, around embedding transferable skills and techniques that they're teaching. Um, being a really responsible library user and researcher is learning those lifelong skills of um, learning to do things independently, to collaborate, to think outside the box, to think creatively. Um, All right. Um, So I think that small um, sample of students and teachers uh, capture some of the major themes around proficiency-based learning, both the things that are going really, really well and the things that remain challenges for us that we are continuing to think about. Um, some, some issues around separating out sort of that knowledge and skill versus work habits is something we're talking about a lot, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. And again, I think what the work speaks to for sure is um, our increased ability to be super clear with kids, to establish learning targets and then give them clear and actionable and specific feedback. Yeah, and I would say you heard one of the, one of the, the boys that spoke in that was, uh, was talking about things being clear. Well, he's a senior. Um, we weren't clear with them throughout all of their time. We got clearer as time progressed. I mean, it was just a part of the process of, of implementing uh, the, the proficiency-based system. Um, and so you didn't hear as much a question of clarity from the, the younger um, two students who spoke in that. Um, and, and I think that these, these are just four voices, but these are sentiments that we hear a lot. Like those were not, um, those weren't just those, uh, yeah, those students saying that. that this is, these are the kinds of ideas that we hear uh, from kids, and they've been uh, comments that we've been dealing with and issues that we've been dealing with for, for several years now. Um, switching the way that you score or grade students is a huge deal because we're all familiar with the system that we grew up in, um, and this is a different system. Um, and so there's a whole lot of research behind what worked and what didn't in, a, in the previous grading system as well. Um, but because it was familiar to us, we probably didn't question the faults in that system. But I would say that one of the faults that was, was a part of the old system is that with a D minus, you, you passed a class and you were deemed ready for whatever the next step was. And, and that is a low bar in our opinion because that D minus included in the old system um, how you behaved in class. And, and that behavior is a wide variety of things. It's everything from participation to turning in work, not necessarily what you knew or you demonstrated that you knew. And so, so those grades in the past were not just what did I know, but how did I behave in class as well? What were those, those learning behaviors that I exhibited? And so a D minus didn't necessarily mean that you knew the material. Uh, a D minus meant that you might have been a compliant student who did just enough. And that is something that's just not available to a student in the proficiency system. And I would point to one of those student comments where she says, you know, you're, I, I knew that I was really close but not quite there to a proficient, 
Well, that's a difference than saying, I just got a D minus, as opposed to saying, I needed a little bit more to show that I was proficient. And so I think she meant it more as a negative in the way she was expressing it. I do understand that. But that's actually a positive of the system. The system says that you have to be able to demonstrate this, uh, this much knowledge and this much understanding to be able to move to proficient. And so if that kid knew that they were really close, then good. That's a positive of it. Most of the time it was, what's the minimum amount of work that I need to do to get by? And so that, I, I understood that she was not seeing it as a positive, but from a perspective of a system, it, I think of it as, as that. And so we want to stop a second. We've thrown a lot at you, and now we want to see if there's some things that we can clarify before we get into a little bit more of the data, because we're going to shift a little bit in what we look, look at. So is there any um, training for students as they come into the system, like the 7th and 8th graders who are, well, training for students so they say, do you understand? Because that one student was saying, well, did you really know what we needed to do? One of the older kids. Yes. Um, did you really know what we needed to do? Um, and the others were looking for more detail, I think kind of more nuance between one, two, three, and four. Correct. Um, but so is the are the students like instructed or trained and say this is how it works, or is it just are they thrown into it or well, how, how do they make that transition? So here's here's the good thing about having a set of student learning outcomes that go from pre-K through graduation is the language doesn't change. So if I need global citizenship from pre-K to graduation, it's the same language, it's the same standards. And so that is going to help us long term. So we don't have to train kids every year to the new system. So you don't come from elementary school and then go to middle school and say, what am I going to learn about? It's the same things, it's just at a deeper level. And so that helps us a lot in terms of the kids understanding what's next. Now, do they understand things like grade point averages and how those are calculated? Not as well, and those are trainings that we start to do with kids now through their callback time. Their teachers understand it better, um, and so we're able to answer those questions better now than, of course, when that kid was a freshman. And so we don't hear as many questions coming from our freshmen now as we do from our seniors uh, because they've been seventh and eighth grade, they've done project-based learning, they're, they're focused on their transferable skills, they understand the language, and they understand the concepts a lot better. And so I would say that the training actually is that they're in classrooms that are more adept at using this language. Yeah, Beer. Um, I have several questions and comments, but I'll split it into a couple right now. Um, so a teacher, are they expected to give a class syllabus, even in middle school, as to expectations and how a child can receive a one, two, three, four? Because if it is, does exist, I haven't seen it. And when a teacher is entering a grade score into IC and it shows up as a two, my understanding was there's supposed to be a comment there as to why. Whether it was incomplete, turned in late, didn't get the content, whatever. And I don't believe, I haven't seen where that's being done. So is there a follow-up with staff on making sure that if we're doing the communication piece, kids don't understand why they're getting to when they're coming from the grade school and they're being set up that. My third part is a child, a student is taking an AP class as a senior. Mm -hmm they're getting scored on the same expectations as a child taking a basic math class. There's no way to GPAs there. Has there been more of a discussion on to how those, those students, their taking AP classes, are graded differently than just a regular standard in math or science? Okay, so three big questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so uh, let's start with the middle question first. So um, comments to students on, uh, so if the student receives a score, how do they know why, right? I think that's kind of the heart of what you asked there. Um, so we spent a lot more time in the last year working on the learning scale. So what does it look like for a student to move from not knowing something to being proficient and beyond, so being advanced uh, in that topic? 
so the teacher should be providing a, a rubric or a learning scale. So those two things can be used interchangeably sometimes as language, but they should show them some kind of scale of here's how your learning is going to progress. Um, I will say that I have not checked every assignment, but I have seen more and more of those used throughout these last few years as we do more and more work on it. Um, and so whether or not that comment shows up on the infinite campus piece, I would say that probably not most of the time. Um, but the student themselves should have a scale that they're able to show. Um, typically in a Google Doc or in a Google Classroom format is where we see a lot of those. I would turn to my students here to say where they see it uh, the most. When, uh, I see, you know, teacher feedback on what we could have done to improve and what was not, what was missing um, to getting a three, primarily on the actual physical stuff that we handed in. Like if we get it's that on the paper. On the paper, yes. yes. On the paper or on or whatever. On the Google Doc. Or on the Google Doc. The, most of the teachers are using a thing called Gubric, which you attach mm -hmm. to the Google Docs. So that's awesome. Yeah, which I find a lot more helpful than a comment in IC because yeah. it can directly address like the individual parts that weren't uh, developed enough or weren't complete enough. And isn't just a vague notion of like what was missing, I guess. Yeah. I feel like most of the students have a basic all the students have a basic understanding of what a one, two, three, or four is, and if you're confused as to why you've got a two, and if it's at that point where you're confused, that's the point where you go to your teacher and you ask. I've done that plenty of times, and I don't think that having it put into IC is the most productive way to know why you have a two. Yeah, I would say that IC, I'm not going to mince words on this, is not the best tool for communicating proficiency and proficiency scores. The unfortunate thing is there aren't a lot of things out there that do a good job with that. Um, most, most scoring systems that are associated with the bigger student information systems were built off of the old system. And so they're not really um, tuned in well to doing those kinds of things. I will say that I, even tomorrow after school, I'm meeting with both of my um, infinite campus um, people, uh, both of my uh, support people for that, so we can talk through how can we continue to improve this. And I think the meets expectations and meets assistance is really important too. You should be seeing that because sometimes a two is the best score that the student can get on that piece or is where they should be. And so that is sort of said by the teacher through that, the student's meeting the expectations. If you see the SA, then that means that they need to seek assistance and go check in with that teacher during a call back for another time, office hours. Yeah. We ask the teachers to put in what we call a current course performance score of ME or SA, so meeting expectations or seek assistance. And it's, a, it's updated every couple of weeks so that students know. We also, as TAs, would know which students are struggling in a class and we can make sure they get to see that teacher. So that's one week. So that's partly answering, I know not fully answering, but partly answering that second question. The third question um, I can answer pretty easily. So AP courses in the past at U32 were not given any additional weight in their grade point average. There was no additional, uh, we, we have at U32 we've never had weighted G, uh, grade point averages. So uh, we've never given extra quality points, we've never given anything else. We don't do class rankings either at U32. That's, that's a past practice that we've carried forward into the proficiency system. Um, I personally believe that that's the right way to go because the way that we typically honor student work is if they reach a, a particular level of work, then we honor them. That's the, um, that's the Latin honor system. Um, says that if you reach this level of performance, then you, you get this honor. If you reach this level of performance, you get the next honor. Um, the reason that that's a better system in my mind is that that does not preclude kids from getting into it. If we only rank the top 20, there's always number 21 in the class who receives no accolades. I personally was number 21 in my class. <laughs> I walked across the stage at graduation to chance from 400 of my closest classmates screaming number 21. Um, and so the top 20 sat in the front row. Um, I sat back with everybody else. My grade point average was 0 .01 below number 20. 
those distinctions aren't important. I, I feel like I'm, I've recovered from that moment. <laughs> um, uh, not that I keep bringing it up or anything. But, but, I would, um, but I would say this is that had it been a cutoff of grade point average, then it could have been the top 50 kids in the class, or it could have been the top three. Um, and so that, that distinction really d depends on the student and, their, and the work that they put into it. And I think that that's a much better system. So we don't weight our AP classes any differently. Um, their scale is, I mean, this is a college class. They're expected to perform at a higher level. Um, and so their scale is pretty tough. So um, students are not just automatically a four just because they're in an AP class, although we find that their scores tend to be in the three and four range uh, most of the time. And they also, AP courses tend to have standards that are beyond some of the standards that we have as a school already. So they don't necessarily easily fit into the student learning of, um, outcomes as we've written them. And that's something that we are working on. It's like, how do we make sure that we show those additional standards that kids may be working on as they move to an AP level class? Um, one of the things that colleges like to see is they like to see that students engage um, in work in the hardest classes or the most difficult classes that a school offers. Um, and so we are very clear on our profile what those courses are. So when someone looks at a transcript, uh, an admissions officer, they see that a student took AP statistics, they can look at our guide and see that an AP statistics class is one of the highest level math classes that we offer. Um, they can look and see it, that they've taken a, um, uh, we do chemistry uh, two, we don't call it AP chemistry. And so if a student takes chemistry two, we say that that is the highest level course that a student could take. And so the students who take that course are therefore shown to be taking our most difficult. And so we make sure that we communicate, and that's one of the things we do on our school profiles, make sure that we communicate that the hardest courses are these courses, or, or the, the most advanced courses that we offer. And so if those show up on a kid's transcript, that shows that they've done the more difficult work. Their scores hopefully reflect the work that they put into it as well. Yeah. I also want to build on a question about the GPA, because that's been in the news a lot. Uh, recently, a little bit of um, fear or trepidation as this first class graduates under the proficiency-based system. And um, just in the past week, I've heard both um, a news report from uh, UVM admissions officers and from Middlebury College admissions officers that it is their responsibility, their job as admissions officers, to understand where these kids are coming from, to understand the school profiles, and to understand the GPA as we calculate it here. Colleges now and for decades have always had uh, kids from all over the country, all different systems. They've always sort of recalculated or reconfigured the GPA to meet their purposes so they can make a good assessment along with other information like other test scores and essays and letters of recommendation around college. But just recently, because of, this is so much in the news around the class of 2020, those admissions officers from two colleges have spoken directly to that point, which I think is a, is a point of fear and anxiety just because it's new for folks. Yeah. Yeah, so the high school I graduated from had a five-point scale for our GPA. I've worked at schools that have had a 14-point quality point average. I, didn't, I never understood it. Um, and then our school actually was a 4.33 scale. It was not a 4.0 scale, it was a 4.33 scale. And so colleges have to take all of these different GPA scales or quality scales or however they're done and figure out how to, to look at the kids. What they typically do is they compare within the school, within the class, where did you fall, like what, what is your score, how do you compare to some of your classmates. We have made that known in a graph on our school profile so that you can see any student that's uh, from a 3.5 to a 4, this percentage of kids fall into that category, and this percentage of kids fall into a 3 to a 3.5. Once again, doesn't preclude, you know, we could have 50% of our kids in any one of those categories, that's fine. Um, and so they can look at that scale and, and see where does this kid fall in relationship to their peers overall in the school. That's generally true of most GPAs. GPA doesn't easily compare kids between schools. We do know that there are issues around merit scholarships and pieces like that. So the other thing I would offer is that our school counselors are making a whole lot of phone calls this year um, and we knew that going in, but they, uh, they are, they are aware of it and they're moving towards making sure that when we have a question about a scholarship, when we have a question about admissions and GPAs, 
how do we address that? And we call admissions people directly. And so I know that we've spoken to admissions directors in Michigan. We've spoken to them in Minnesota. We've definitely spoken to a lot of them here in the Vermont area and in the Northeast. And as kids continue to apply to schools, we continue to make those uh, phone calls because we want to make sure that that information is there and in front of them so that we can make sure that those schools can make a good decision about our kids. So I'm going to keep going. You're going to have some more questions, I'm sure. And so, um, so did you want this or did you? So, so what do students need to do in order to earn a U32 diploma? There's actually a policy about this. They have to be proficient in our SLOs. So our SLOs are the literacy, math, science, global citizenship, PE and health, artistic expression, financial literacy, and transferable skills. And the transferable skills are those things like problem solving, working independently and collaboratively, um, and uh, yeah, the communications. So there's, there's several, there are six, not several, there are six um, skills there. And so the policy is, is written that our students have to be proficient in all of the standards of the SLO. And then in the past, you had to have 22.5 credits in order to graduate. So I took four English classes for four, four credits, including one credit in comp and lit. In math, I'd have three. Science, I'd have three. Social studies, three, including a US history. PE was one and a half. Health was 0.5. Fine arts was one credit. Financial literacy was half a credit. And so that's what you had to do. You had to take those classes. You had to get a D minus, and you were good. That's what got you out of U32 in the past. And I know I say that a little, like, but that was it. That was our standard for graduation. Take all of those credits and get a D minus in those classes. That was our, our standard. That was the ball. So now how does it look? So I know this is a little bit small, but the class of 2020, at the end of their junior year, 63% of them had met proficiency in artistic expression, 61% of them in financial literacy, 38% in global citizenship, 6% in literacy, 52% in math, 73% in PE and health, 45% in scientific inquiry, and 22% in the transferable skills. So those were, that's the percentage of kids who had met all their proficient, all the standards, proficient in all the standards in each one of those categories. One of them should jump out at you, <laughs> right? Literacy. Don't freak out, though, because I want to go right back to the last slide and say, how long did it typically take you to get through an English program in the way that we had it? It takes four years right, to get through a typical English program. Our kids are really showing that same thing. It's through the end of their junior year. They are not proficient yet in all the work that we need to do in our uh, English courses and our literacy. And so, that, that shows, but it also is there as well. Yeah, Vera? So in that 6%, that shows the students who doubled up on English? Probably. Before their junior year. Right. So that's, that's the few students, that's probably three kids, who had either doubled up or done something else to demonstrate that, that, uh, that they met their literacy standards. Where you can see that like PE and health, and um, I think financial lit is a really good one to show. That's almost saying that 61% of our kids took the financial literacy class, right? So th there's some there are some standards that are met really by one course, and uh, financial literacy and uh, health are two of those where kids pretty much should meet their standards by taking the course. And so you see that a lot of kids have already done that. Math, where you see a 52%. Um, these are kids who probably doubled up or uh, started um, algebra in the eighth grade and have just progressed through at a little bit faster pace um, so that we have those numbers. Let me contrast this with our class of 2021. So this is through their sophomore year, right? So this is the, the current juniors. So through their sophomore year, we see that 53% have met their artistic expression already. 9% have met their financial literacy. 0% in both global citizenship and literacy. Kind of makes sense. Um, mathematical content and practices, that's 39%. At the end of their sophomore year, many of them have had, so there, there's about 39% of our kids who have had geometry and algebra two, which algebra two is kind of the cutoff point where the proficiency can be met. 
So by the end of Algebra 2, you should be able to have met all of your math proficiencies. PE and health, we see that about half of the kids, 18% in science, and transferable skills is an interesting one because that's 65% of them have shown proficiency by the end of their sophomore year. Um, we're going to put those side by side. So class of 2020, only 22% met their transferable skills by the end of their junior year, and class of 2021, 65%. Um, I would say that this is us understanding our transferable skills a little bit better in the way that we score them. And I would offer this, and I'm happy to say it in a public forum, is that there are some aspects of this program that are the fault of us, the school, in them not reaching that moment. Remember those three areas I talked about? Statistics, engineering, um, and economics? We can do as much as we can, but we can also not fault kids for not being able to do all of that work. And so what we've gone back and looked at in some of those cases is how much work did they do in economics, right? We gave them several opportunities, but not enough opportunities. How did they do with that? And so we're having to reevaluate to make sure that we don't hold them responsible for our curricular mistakes. Transferable skills is one of those areas. We we never really assessed that stuff separately. We just marked participation and completion, but we really didn't talk about what are your problem solving skills like? How does that rank on a scale? You know, so we never did those kinds of things. And you can see that as we can start to learn more about them and teach them at a younger grade, we tended to do better um, at our evaluation and our, our um, assessment of those skills. Yeah, I think that for me, this slide points out to, um, points to continuous improvement too in the system. There, this was new for us, and we have been doing a lot of work and a lot of studying and a lot of uh, iteration and improvement, as Stephen just talked about. I want to um, really shout out to our teachers, because they have been the backbone of the system. They have worked so incredibly hard. So as we're seeing trends and making adjustments, it's our teachers who are going right back in and having those conversations and making adjustments to their courses and their programs and their assessment practices. And, um, and we're seeing continuous improvement. Yeah, and, and I would point out here, when you look and you see that, well, if only 63%, they need to graduate. Right? That needs to be 100%. Every one of these things needs to be 100% for every kid to graduate. And so when we look at this, those other kids, that other 37% of the kids, what we have to make sure of, and we have been going through and double checking ourselves uh, even this year, the beginning of this year, is are they in the courses that will help them meet those needs? And we have identified a couple of kids where we're like, you know what, You're, you've got a great schedule, but next semester we really need to make sure that you finish off that artistic expression, right? That you do that before you graduate. And so we have a couple of kids, but when I say a few, we're down to like, the vast majority of our kids are taking the appropriate courses right now to be able to meet these standards because that was that piece I talked about all of our scheduling, um, really sitting down and looking at that. And we've double checked that here at the beginning of the year. So Jen has led a lot of that effort, but herself, myself, the school counselors, we've gone through and we keep looking at the kids. Are they taking the right courses? Are they doing the right thing so that these all end up at 100%? And so that's. <laughs> That's the best I can offer with all of that data. What's, I don't remember what the next slide is. This is the graduation. Can you go oh, back to the transfer? I'd be skills? happy to go back. Can you just give us an overview? Like, what is the process right now between TAs, counselors, teachers that you're going through to make sure that those transferable skills have been met? And there's no, oops, we missed you. To tag on to that, well, how much of that impacts the, the score? So the transferable skills don't contribute to the grade point average right now. So um, although there's a lot of discussion about how that should be a part of the grade point average. Um, and so, um, so those are work habits, a, a lot of that. Um, a lot of this is talking with those teachers in the senior year. And, and what we think we're going to be able to do, where we're still putting it all together, is that we need to have a conversation with the kids that are in this graduating class of 2020 that is a small conversation. The kid, an advocate, you know, whoever they want with them, and a couple of teachers, and say, OK, tell us where you met these transferable skills over your time here at U32. 
and, uh, and just have them have the conversation about, here's how I demonstrated my uh, engaged citizenship. Here's how I demonstrated um, that I was a problem solver, and do that. I think our first class, while I don't want to say we're giving them a pass, they're going to have to have that conversation. I think because we weren't evaluating this properly in those earlier grades, we weren't getting enough opportunities to actually evaluate it, but they were actually doing it. And so that was, I think, our disconnect, is the kids were doing this kind of work. They were engaged citizens in all kinds of things. So we have kids outside of school doing all kinds of things that shows engaged citizenship. We weren't capturing that. We weren't able to, to bring that together. And so we're just putting together what's a process we can do here right at the beginning of the second semester so that they can have that conversation and we can check these things off so that we can make sure, OK, yes, you have done a lot more work than we certainly recognized over the three and a half years that you've been doing it. And, um, and that will help here. That's going to help our class of 2020, and we're just getting it better now as we as we move into our junior year. And so I think the conversations are something we want to hold. That'll be where the TA, a school, you know, a, a classroom teacher, possibly the school counselor, just just have that. And, and they're called academic conversations. We've seen it done at other schools, and so we've learned from. The, and those are outside of actually Vermont that we've seen those at that are really well. So that's that's going to be our first go at doing it. And I think that that would take care of a lot of them. Yeah. There's some kids in the summer, I remember a couple of them said that they were doing the summer school because it would help them get, once they realized that there was a... Yeah, they, they show up in these pieces now. Okay. So those were kids who, these percentages may be in a little bit lower had we not had some kids come to summer school. In fact, that financial literacy would have definitely, because we had several kids who did that. Yeah, when, when we talk about, um, again, trying to create more flexible opportunities and making the system less time bound, summer school was definitely a step in that direction. So the students who participated, participated exactly for these reasons and to keep other options open for them their senior year. Yeah. And I would also offer, too, that this represents every student in our school. So we have some students who will move to our transition academy. We have other students who might need additional time. These numbers are never going to be 100% for one year because there are students who will require additional time uh, for, what, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and some of them are through no fault of the child or no fault of the system. It's just they need more time. And so I would offer that as much as we would love to see these be 100% right down the board, the odds of that happening are, are almost infinitesimally small because we will have kids who need an additional year or additional two years depending on their needs and their learning plans. And so so that, that's, that's also part of the, this is everybody. Yeah, so we want to just kind of get you a, a little bit of the data. So the challenges that we're facing, so our graduation rate is pretty, is held pretty steady. Um, you can see from 88 to 90 percent. Um, we do not have our 2019 figure verified yet. We, we tried and tried and tried and could not get that. Um, and then the other side of this is our college attendance rate. And so, um, so these are from the uh, clearinghouse data. So these are the kids who just who go to college directly from uh, from U32 and enroll in their first year. There's a lot of data. That's a different discussion about college clearinghouse data that we'll have sometime when things settle down. Um, and then we we see that um, this last one was self-reported in 2019. We don't have the clearinghouse data of how many kids actually went. Um, and 65 percent of them said that they were going on to some form a two or four year college beyond U32. Uh, Next one? All right. So um, we wanted to throw this up there. There's, a, you want to, uh, yeah, I'll let well, you. Sir. So we, um, you know, we've been, we engage in a lot of professional learning and last spring we had the opportunity to do some professional learning about designing adult learning. And, um, and this concept came up around just challenges and, and fears that might come up when there's new learning, and they're called scarf threats, right? But sometimes when there's resistance or fear to change, it's really about these things. So sort of status, you know, how is this going to impact my relative importance to, with others? What about certainty? Like, how? What, what if I can't predict exactly what's going to happen? Or autonomy, you know, a sense of losing a little bit of control over the way things are going. Relationships, how might this change impact my relationships with others, my connections with others? And what about fairness? Is it really a fair exchange? Is this going to, you know, take that balance out? 
So those are some of the things that we've heard. And we spoke earlier in this presentation already about some of the fears that we have heard about the uncertainty of the class of 2020. This is brand new. We've been operating under a Carnegie unit system for a very, very long time, decades and decades. So of course it's new. And we understand the, um, that people might have fears and anxieties. We've been working really hard to have the direct conversations, to do the work, to roll up our sleeves around proficiency-based work and make sure that we're doing the very best that we can by our kids, knowing that we don't know everything yet. It's, it's not going to be perfect yet, um, but we're going to continue to ensure that our kids' needs are met and that they are poised for post-secondary success. Yeah. All right. So, so what's next? Uh, there's a lot. But um, so I mentioned earlier that we have a group of kids who have grown from just a, an advisory group to now they're called Youth and Adults Transforming Schools Together. That's YATS. They're going to be collecting data on the school, not just proficiency work, but climate, culture. There's several issues that they're looking to explore and see what the students, uh, what are students thinking? What are they feeling? What is staff thinking? What are they feeling? at this point in time. And so that data is going to be coming out. Um, they're, going to, they're, they're going to present that to you, not adults. That's the kids will be presenting that um, uh, when we get that data together. That will probably be closer to the first of the year, right? Maybe, yeah, I'm looking at one of my kiddos for that. Um, and so, so we're doing that. Um, the role of transferable skills in scoring and reporting, that's a big one, because we've really started to talk about how should this get included into um, course scores, how should this get included into GPA calculations? There's some thoughts about how this might work, and, and, and we're certainly having those conversations, um, teachers and kids alike. How to create more flexibility and increase access in a time-bound system. This is one of the hardest things that we're going to uh, address um, over the next several years. Our structure looks very similar to the Carnegie system that we've been in before, but is that the right structure? Our classes, the way we've structured them, you know, every other day for an hour and a half, is that the appropriate way for us to teach in a proficiency system? Um, there's a lot of questions of should the day, school day be a different configuration? Should it be longer? Should it be shorter? Should it be with um, online options? There are all kinds of questions to consider in this. This will be a discussion that takes us well into the next several years because there are all kinds of implications around busing and, and sports and anything you can possibly name at the school. Uh, we are about to roll out Personalized Learning Plans 2.0, so we've done a lot of work around that, which will expound on how the transferable skills are also scored. And we are um, starting to think about Standards 2.0 which is how do we look at our standards now that we've done them for a few years, is what changes need to be made, what refinements do we need to make in those, those standards, and what else? I mean, there's, I'm sure that there are other things that you could suggest that we look at next. Both teachers, students, administrators, kids, board members, parents, everybody's got something um, that we could probably address next. So questions, comments, concerns, what's next, what else? So how do parents get about the proficiency system, educating about it, and dealing with the challenges and overcoming the challenges with it? That's an awesome question, because where you can find more information, so we put, we put some of it out there on the web. We also created booklets. We will hand out some of these booklets so that you as a board have them. Um, we have grading guides. We have um, a guide to uh, the proficiency-based learning pre-K to graduation. Um, I have put out uh, emails in, in the past. We've got a newsletter that, that puts out some of that information. Our teachers are hopefully communicating some of that as well. Tonight was uh, parent-teacher conferences, and they continue on Monday. That's part of the comprehensive reporting system as well. Yeah. So that's Coffee with the principal. Oh, yeah, you can come to coffee with me. I'll actually be at Doty in a week, I think next Thursday morning. I'm, so I'm reaching out to the elementary schools to do coffee in the morning at each of the elementary schools so the parents that have kids at both typically throw their high school or middle school on the bus and then drop off their kid. They can stop by and ask questions. So we try to do some other things. Is there? I'm just, so this breakdown, like proficiency for graduation, is there a proficiency for like you know, freshman year standard, like what would it look like, the percentage of kids meeting what they need to learn freshman, the end of freshman year, the end of sophomore year? 
So you would look more at the course scores. So, okay. so, so the distinction there is between are you meeting the graduation proficiency, which we do on the uh, beginning developing proficient advanced scale, and the course score, which is done on the one, two, three, four scale. Um, so if I wanted to know if my kid was doing well on their freshman year courses, I would look at their course scores more than I would look at their graduation what proficiency. Is, overall, like, is the freshman class how are they all doing, you know, in meeting those? So we don't know yet. Okay. I mean, just to be honest, with their towards graduation, we wouldn't know yet because those scores haven't even, we haven't even done that assessment of where they are in their graduation standards because they've only been doing it for one quarter. Okay. So we can look at our sophomores and do, so we broke down our, same thing. yeah, we can do the same breakdown we just did with our seniors and our juniors and look at our sophomores. So that was like the zero for the juniors for literacy because they're not meeting the proficiency for graduation, but what are their, are they meeting a standard for? So how are they doing in their coursework yeah. in general? We can look at that, we didn't bring that data okay. with us, but we can certainly look at, yeah, how are they performing in the courses that they're taking? Yeah, the, whole, another, the whole class, not just individual. Another whole set of data that we can bring in, we've looked at as, we, we look at regularly as well. Sorry, it's very hard for me to. I get it. Like we, You're doing a great job. I'm surprised you can speak about it so easily. We're trying. Well, I had to do this a couple of times with some parents in this room. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we've, we, part of what we're seeing is that over time, people are able to explain it better. We phase this in, and so one of the, the, the problems with a phase in was that there are some teachers who primarily teach juniors and seniors. And those teachers didn't have two years of working on this in the same way as a teacher who had freshmen who was thrown into this four years ago. So our, fre our teachers who have freshmen primarily in the freshman teams have been doing this now for four years. They're getting much better at explaining it. The teachers who taught mostly juniors and seniors, last year was the first year they really had to explain it. And so that's where, when, when the student says there's confusion, that's primarily where a lot of that confusion comes in. And while we know, there, there's one of two ways to do it, right? Everybody does it on day one, or we phase it in. We felt like the phase in was the best option for us, um, but there are some drawbacks, and that was that, that consistency and that confusion just isn't, hasn't been taken care of yet. There's students in the audience, and I wonder if they have anything to contribute to the conversation since they took the time to be. They're here for a different issue as well, but oh. anything you guys want to offer? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to the U32 Chronicle and see an article about these <laughs> things <laughs> right, from a student perspective, which I would highly encourage um, that you that you look at the, the School Chronicle. There are several articles that students have written about, about this with some good research about where we're going and what we're doing. Right. Thank you. I, I mean, there's going to be a lot more questions. We're going to keep bringing some more pieces of this up. And I think there's a question back there in the back. I just, you're behind the camera, I think. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 I've been having trouble with the proficiency system. My son is a senior. I'm not terribly good with it at this point. It's I'm struggling. Like last year was the first year where meeting with the TA, she's like, well, you need these classes in order to meet the proficiencies. Great, we got him in these classes. How do I know what part of those classes are gonna make sure that he meets that proficiency? I don't want him to have to go to school beyond this year. He should be done. I'm, I'm ready to be done, okay? Understood. So, you know, I see some of those uh, statistics that you had up there where literacy was at 6% on that senior class. And does that not cause you to pause? I mean, it didn't sound like you were that worried about it, but to me, I, I would be panicking. Why? Is that doesn't seem like it's a sense of urgency. Okay, so the, yeah, so my, why I'm not worried about it is the sense of urgency is that those teachers are aware that the students in their class, those seniors in their class, have final work to do to be able to finish up in a proficiency system, just demonstrate, you know, that third paper on expository writing, that second research paper, those kinds of things that, that they do in their senior year that are a culmination of the work that they've done across their four years. If I didn't think that my teacher, my English department has been working nonstop for four years to make sure that the progression of work 
from year to year is making sure that the kids are going to be able to demonstrate that proficiency and that they're doing a really good job of tracking um, where students are in that process. And Alden, if you, I mean, if you don't mind, I mean, you can speak maybe a little bit to the fact that the department, Alden's one of our English teachers, and, and he also teaches seniors, um, so he under, I, I think he could probably relay the sense of urgency better than I can of, of his work. I, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is what we just spent this evening doing with parent conferences, was communicating this, and, and, and you're right to uh, ask these questions and to be a little concerned, but um, I, I'd echo what Stephen said. We've, we've, we've been really vigilant about keeping an eye on these students and um, I've had lots of conversations with parents to this extent already this year. So uh, as an English teacher, I'm not worried about it. I mean, I'm just... I know, so I could probably answer more one-on-one -on -one some specific questions about your own child, which would be better than in this forum. Right. And so I'd be happy to talk to you separately. Yeah, if, I if just, you'd like you know, that. I worry with the statistic that were there. It's like, can you honestly say that, you know, we'll say 90% of the class is going to graduate on time? I know that my staff is keenly aware of the kids who are sitting in front of them right now who need to meet their proficiencies. And they're meeting with them at callback, and they're talking to them regularly, and they are making sure. We're not worried about some kids because we've seen them demonstrate across the years, um, and we can see that they're taking the right classes. So the kid who's not meeting an art but has been a good, solid student and is just going to take one more art class. We're, we're, we know that that kid's gonna meet those standards. In the same way that we had kids who took English in their senior year for their fourth credit of English, we weren't worried about the vast majority of them doing what they needed to do to pass that class and get that credit. It's the same thing, it just looks different when we say only 6%. I mean, we used to say about you know 5% of them had met their credit requirements, and so they still, you know, 95% of them still had one more credit to take. And so we just never put that data up before. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the time. Oh, we no, appreciate it. Well, <coughs> Stephen, I, I just wanted to tell you how helpful this has been. The fact that we had it recorded so that people from our communities can uh, also view it is extremely helpful. And uh, the fact that it's also been in the news quite a bit lately, as we all know. And it, it's wonderful to see that we've been working on this for six years. And that while we're not saying we've completely arrived, we've made great progress and we have confidence in the situation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, um, we've devoted a lot of time to this, but the time is really in proportion to the importance of it. And I, I hope that it has at least helped a little bit to improve understanding and um, to clarify somewhat what can seem a, a pretty mysterious system. Um, and it's not, the, the discussion is not over. Uh, it's over for today on this subject, but not <laughs> over um, in general. So um, 4.0, consent agenda and reports. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of October 16th and October 23rd, please? Chris and Vera. Any changes to the minutes? I had one question. Um, the, uh, the, on page two, the special meeting, uh, I took those notes. I realized that there is no notation in there about any decision or conclusion that was reached, whereas I think it was Lisa that was kind enough to point out to me on the 23rd that we did need to list, though, though there are no details about what we were discussing, on the 23rd it does say the board made no finding. Uh, but for the 16th special meeting, there is no note in there about what conclusion we reached. Not to, I, I don't know if that's appropriate or not. Say the um, the board supported or did yeah. you support the administration's recommendation? Yeah. Thank you, Jones. Wait, sorry. 
Sorry, did you want me to add something to that? Um, if you could, please, Lisa. After adjournment or before adjournment? Before adjournment. What, um, uh, how was it on the other agenda? Yeah, between the other agenda. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 The board voted to, uh, to accept the administration's recommendation. Other, other issues? Looks okay? Good. All right. All in favor of approving the minutes of October 16 and October 23rd, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Great. 4.2, uh, to approve the board orders. Um, May I ask? I've seen them. Um, oh, I, have the, I have the numbers here. Okay. Um, the rules that we approve orders of one million five hundred twenty-six thousand three hundred thirty-seven fifteen cents, and thirty-seven thousand eight hundred sixty-four and forty-four. Did you catch that, Lisa? I think I got it. Do you want me to send it back to you or no? So Dorothy has moved? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, second. Chris seconds. Um, we had a chance to review these board orders uh, electronically. Did anyone have any questions? No? I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, all in favor so, of. Sorry. I, I, did, I did scan. I had a chance to like, like scan it every time. Um, at, at some point, could. I mean, maybe it's Lori. Could you give us five or ten minutes about how to read those documents? Okay. A little closer. Yeah. No, no, not, not necessarily right now. Because <laughs> we're training. We're doing the budget. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, um, that's a good idea. Great. All in favor of approving the board orders for the amounts that Dorothy cited, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Very good. So what we're going to do for the superintendent report and the leadership team report, uh, we're not asking the superintendent or the leadership team to say anything, except in response to board questions. So are there any board questions for, in the, in the first instance, for Deborah on her superintendent report? Questions only? Or, or comments, sure. I would like to thank Deborah for the section about the racism training. I thought that was a difficult read, an important read, and I appreciate you laying it out in very stark terms. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was wondering if what the follow-up on this will be. Like, uh, after we going to this training, what you're hoping to do to accomplish, to, uh, what you're hoping to do uh, with this information? Well, I think this is an area that I have been studying for a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that for approximately 10 of our staff members in as, uh, you know, a protected class, um, then they, um, we investigate that. We have a full process of investigating that. So, you know, our position is, is that we already can investigate any of these symbols as part of our current policy and that if it is causing a disruption or disturbance to the student then certainly we can take action um, our primary method of taking action is to educate and and so um, our our goal isn't to remove a kid from school because of wearing a confederate flag our goal is to help them understand what it means and why it causes someone else to feel um, that uh, that is a symbol of hate, like it's harassment, whatever those those issues are. We try to help the other student understand. We have been successful in having students not wear the symbol back into school. 
um, after they find out like what its full meaning is. Because when you ask some of the kids, like, what is the meaning of this to you, it is not as a hate symbol. And that's why I understand the, the, the intent, regardless of intent, is a part of the policy. Um, but I would also offer that I've had students in my office who feel threatened because the Black Lives Matter flag flies over the school. I, regardless of intent, if a student doesn't feel comfortable coming into the school because of that, this policy might tell me that the flag has to come down. And I think that that's the furthest extreme in terms of example that I can give you right now. But if a student came to me and said that they weren't comfortable because of it, this policy tells me that the flag comes down. I find that perverse. <laughs> I do too. And I think this may not be the right policy, but I think as we have these conversations, we're adults and we're grown-ups and we live in 2019. And I think we can distinguish between the actual, actual effects of a Black Lives Matter flag and the actual real life effects of a Confederate flag. So okay. let's 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 revise and edit the policy how, how we need to. But I find I, I find that logical retreat to be perverse. Understood. That I'm not putting it out there because I agree with it. I, I, I understand, but I just want to get that on the record. Right. Speech can come to so I was going to say that I, I, I don't say, I, I, you had me until you said the Black Lives Matter fact. I, I agree that the policy on harassment takes care of what's going on at U32. I, I believe strongly that those conversations, as uncomfortable that it would make a student in that class, and I, you know, if it gets to the point that it's harassment, it should be addressed as harassment, but the more opportunities that we have to teach global citizenship through that, because you're going to be contributing to the democracy. So when you go out in the world, this is going to be part of your everyday addressing bias mm -hmm. all the time, having to you know, have those conversations. So sometimes those hateful conversations are better addressed by more conversations. And I guess I'm more interested in you to, to engage in more of those you know, bias training and you know, teaching more about the civil war, like, you know, using every single opportunity to get everybody to to sit together and, and learn more about it and not, we, we can, you know, we can just throw, sort of put a safe guard around, uh, around our students because they're going to be part of a larger democracy and we want them to be strong to defend the democracy. That, that's all about. Oh, I'm sorry, John. A question. Just in terms of procedure, so if a student walked in wearing a SWATS coat and no, one, no, no other student came up and complained about that, would we that... Would, we would immediately address okay. if we saw a symbol. Because I'm just concerned about putting the burden on the victim or the one no. student. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. We, we address that when we see it. So, if, so what would prompt an address like that? SWATS coat is very clear example. Would a Confederate flag be a clear example of that as well? We've been yes. addressing it. Okay, We've where been having those discussions. We, act, we actually, the one Confederate flag that a student was wearing, we had conversations that was removed. And now we now actually we have, have, we have yeah. another one that is making its rounds. A different kid wears it each day. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that is in protest to the potential ban. Mm -hmm. And so we have to address it with those students. I mean, it's it's a hard one. I mean, if there was an easy answer to this, I would be happy to give it to you and we, we could move on. But, you know, our primary goal is as an educational institution to teach our kids, you know, what's what's good, what's not good. But that's still subjective to those who are approaching it. We try to help our kids understand through our restorative practice, you know, that what you do has an impact, even if it's not your intent, you know. And that's that's a hard thing to learn. I mean, adults still have a hard time understanding the difference between the intent that they have and the impact that they have on things that they do and say and where. And so we're we're your front lines in trying to figure out how to communicate that to kids and families. And, and 
I think that this policy, like I don't know that this policy affords us any additional tools in terms of dealing with these issues, um, which is what a policy should do. It should direct us as to how we can help solve a problem. Just simply removing something when we can actually have a conversation about it being removed through our hazing, harassment, bullying process, um, I don't know how it adds to our, our existing policies. I have one more question. Is it predominantly um, students of color that are asking for this ban? I, Seeking some justice. I, I, I wouldn't have said. I don't think in terms of the presentation. I don't, I don't, I don't, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Nor have we classified it by that, that category. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, like from their perspective, how they support it or... So we, we wouldn't necessarily go directly to them to ask them what they thought. I, I, I think that because that, that might imply a little bit of tokenism in terms mm -hmm. of that response, but, um, but it's been brought by a diverse group of students okay. to our attention. Just the, the perspective, you know, like... Mm -hmm. The problem with doing that is you're asking a student to speak for their entire race, and that's a really uh, uncomfortable and, and um, inappropriate way to talk to the kids. Um, so we, we have a group of students who have this issue brought to us, and that's the group that we engage with. Blam has been talking about it, and I think we have some concerns with it, too, because, I mean, we don't need a ban to know that we don't want those kinds of symbols around and I don't think that this ban because this these problems exist whether or not you have the Confederate flag in the equation. If you take it out, they're still there. That's not it. And I think that this ban I haven't read the policy and I don't know fully what it entails, but I don't think it has enough of what Alden and everybody has been saying. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> about the RP, maybe having more RP into it and having that discussion part of it, because I, I personally don't think that the ban is going to solve any problems. I think that it's not. I just don't. I was just thinking about wearing them in school, but if we highlight or whatever that something is going to bother. What about bumper stickers on your car out in the parking lot? Or there are a couple of trucks that drive around central Vermont with the really big yeah. Confederate flag out the back if it's parked in your parking lot. Is that as um, from this, can that also be banned if it's on your bumper sticker when you're talking freedom of speech or having a sign in my front yard. Um, I was thinking back to the Take Back Vermont type signs. Those were hateful signs. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking of a lot of things that. And, and I, I think the answer would be yes, because it's on school property. Mm -hmm. It just says the shirt or whatever it is that the student has is on school property. So that would be the extent, I think, to which this school would have policy jurisdiction. Because like it's so, a permission to park your car here anyway. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Any other comments? So we have some direction. Should we try? See what something is there? Is there a sense of board to um, try and work with this policy in any way, or to not adopt the policy? Is there I don't a sense? Say, I actually don't support this policy as it is um, for reasons that have already been brought up. I think the more that we can need the administration to teach and educate in this environment is the best way to approach a kid that does not necessarily understand what their room are doing at all times. Um, there are some young kids in this school. It's not just 9th or 12th. And I honestly believe it. You know, there are times that kids do something that they don't know. And to have an environment where they're being educated by administration here, I think is a better form than just having a policy that bans something. Um, well, I want to be clear, right? This doesn't just ban it. 
Right. It says that you are then in violation of the policy on harassment, hazing, and bullying, which I believe then requires by statute an investigation mm -hmm. and a whole series of events after that. Actually, this precludes an investigation that says you are in violation. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so there is no investigation. Right. It's just you're in violation. But it, sets, it sets that machinery in, in, in motion. Right. And that's probably not appropriate. Um, I. I don't think anyone here, I don't hear any support for this policy around the table, but it does seem to me that, Stephen, as you mentioned, you're in the business of trying to teach kids what is right and what is wrong, and in some ways a school reflects the values of its community. Um, and in the few months that I have been on this board, it's, you know, we are supposed to deliver to the school community what our values are and what the values are that we hope are, you know, advanced in the school system. And I hope that it is the sense of this board that the Confederate flag is a hate symbol and has no place in our schools. Whether or not there is a First Amendment issue, right, or a gray area issue, or a political issue, I hope that that is the sense of this board. So this is a policy to ban, um, just let me finish, um, we should fashion it um, as a policy to explain why hate symbols are destructive and harmful and adopt that as the board policy to address your concerns. Sure. Okay? Sure. Because it would be, you know, specifically to hate symbols mm -hmm. um, and the recognizing the effect that they can have and that they don't reflect our values as a school community. So just not a ban, but then a positive assertion of what you folks are already doing. So it would be a policy that just says that the principles are bad, the principles are Correct. Yeah. Like a reflection of what our values are. What would it uh, then ensure that uh, people wearing hate symbols would go through an educational process? I think, yeah. I think it, what I was saying in terms of policy would be um, directing the administration to address that with individuals who were wearing or um, for, uh, being proponents of hate symbols. So, or something to that so, so might I offer that the board, it sounds like the board is not a policy but a position a statement yeah. that the board would have um, because yeah but that's okay that that's for you guys to figure out how you want to do it um, but I would say that kind of in response to um, to what Towns was was asking about is that it might be wise for us to uh, discuss the hazing harassment and bullying policy is what the administrative procedures are associated with that and so um, so that way because because your policy should be your policy, and then how we address that policy, that's something that we can say, here's the administrative procedures that we have around that, so that you as a board are comfortable, are we addressing it to your policy, right? So that are we addressing this appropriately according to the policy that you've set, is what it sounds like to me. And if you have a hazing and harassment policy, or we do, you do. we have to, yeah. um, it would fall under that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is, is there a specific part about race in the hazing Yes. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, well, I mean, like, does it have its own way of going about? So if somebody, if there's a hazing and harassment situation and it's specifically racial, does it have a different process than that? No, that's the harassment process. It, it, it falls under harassment. It's a protected category, but there's a number. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I understand. I'm saying that I think that there might, that this might, instead of a ban, it might be that what some students of color might be looking for is a different process when you come forward with a racist, racially charged situation rather than it just going immediately to a harassment, hazing, and bullying situation. Do you want me to just read the definition of harassment and then hold up the I would, no, I understand that it fits under race. I'm saying that the way that the administration goes about when somebody, so if you come forward with a racial situation, it immediately goes under that, and that has a specific process of doing it. I'm saying that there should be a different process for specifically racial situations. 
How about, how, the, how about we share, like in a future meeting, let's let's share what we do in that process and, and have a conversation about does it meet, does it meet the statement that the board is making without making a formal statement yet about not wanting this? In other words, are we addressing the board's policy in a way that is appropriate to the board? So, but Stephen, I just want to interject about the HHB policy, yes. there's not a lot of wiggle room. Mm -hmm. There's state law. Understood. Yeah. I'm not saying okay. change the like, policy. No, I want to, just for me as understanding. Oh, yeah. yeah but the, the, we're required by law to respond in certain ways. Yeah. And so we don't have a lot of wiggle room around that. But, but I guess what I want to, um, sort of picking up, and, and, what, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm reading into what you're asking, and sort of my concern is, are there students who are feeling like, for whatever reason, um, responses to issues of race are not being addressed. So it might be instead of what is sort of the specific process, which is really mandated by law, that's very prescriptive. But is there is there something help else happening, sort of climate-wise? Uh, which is why I asked the the clarifying question because I think it, it's what, what, how, how are students feeling? Um, are students feeling like it's, it's getting a due process? Sort of what's the, what's the question behind the question, I guess, is, is really what I'm thinking and maybe to, to get some talking and thinking done about what is the feeling of a person, is there a feeling of a perceived lack of a response, I guess? No, I don't think it's a lack of a response. I think that sometimes people feel that, so in a case of like a standard bullying, you can say like, oh, that's wrong. Like you shouldn't do that and it becomes evident why it's wrong, but a lot with racial situations, you have to know why it's wrong and it's not immediately evident. And I think that there has to be a more educational aspect rather than just a punishment. So it sounds like more education for the law, the state law. I think I hear a theme of education. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Not surprisingly. The educational piece coming in with the restorative practice. Yes. 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 I think the restorative practice has, is a good part of it, and I think that's a good step forward with the <coughs> I think was it Rebecca Holcomb, I was trying to find if I can find it. When I find it, I'll send it to everybody. She sent, I remember her writing a really great, uh, back in 2017, this question and writing a memo to with guidance. And it was both. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was around the time that uh, that Montpelier raised the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and, and it was, I, I don't remember, you know, I can't, I'm trying to find it, but I'll find it. And But she, I, I remember that making an impact on, on mm -hmm. a lot of, when they were, everybody was going out to write policies. And I know that we read it at some point. I just don't, mm -hmm. I don't have it in front of me. But it was really good advice for us. So mm -hmm. it would be interesting for us to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, any sense on how you want us to proceed as possible? I think, <clears throat> pardon me, I think you've heard, this has been by the way, one of the best discussions that I've heard in this board yet. Magnificent interventions at an hour when I can barely string together a grammatical <laughs> sentence. Um, my own sense is that um, if you take back to, the, to your policy committee uh, essentially what you've heard and different, different voices with different positions and um, and I was sort of ponder it and, um, and see, what, where, see where it takes you. And what more information or direction is needed for it to be either supported or taken? So do you want to suggest a policy? A positive policy in terms of what no. we... I think it's a position. I really recommend no. that we no. first oh, okay. examine in detail the current policy before we okay. make an, any amendments to it. And I, and I know the board has delved into it in the past, within the recent past, but I, th I think we need to be informed about what the state is requiring of us and see if there's a way to augment that to include an educational component. 
I can say for certain that when there are issues that are brought forward and that a student identified as having violated that policy, that there not it's not only discipline, but there's also restorative practices that we put in place to ensure that all of our students come to a greater understanding about how their actions affected others. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're implementing and have for some time here at U32. I think there's just more to this conversation as in terms of our current practice that we need to figure out before mm -hmm. moving forward. That was a suggestion I heard from several people before we take time to write the policy. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I mean, I'm just a, I, I, I completely understand what people are saying about the lack of an educational component. I think that's really important. But I would like to emphasize, I'd like people, just people to recognize that this is non, hate symbols are an ongoing issue in, at this school. And that um, I just, I just want to impart people with a sense of urgency, I guess, that every, that every week we don't address it is a week where students are harmed. And that uh, uh, I think that it needs to be the uh, policy and whatever it needs to be done well, but that also enable to minimize the damage. It also needs to be quickly, and so I just want to leave people with that. Thank you. Um, anyone? Okay. So the next policy we have for consideration. Is the comprehensive um, sexual health program policy C50? Do you have anyone who would like to address? Sure. Speak to the policy. The hypothesis was saying I was living since 7 a.m. <laughs> and I have a sprained ankle. Oh, no. uh, my name is Meg Falvey. I am the middle and high school health educator. One of them. I also teach. Uh, I teach middle uh, middle school living arts as well. I actually did not come prepared, um, not in the sense of, let me take that back. Of course I'm prepared, I'm prepared every day. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that uh, the two students that presented to, this, to the policy committee did a, did a, have done a great job and probably will do a much better job than I will this evening at this time. Um, but we simply proposed uh, that our school has a condom accessibility policy that's put in place and um, I, I believe, I'm assuming, a year and a half ago, you have all had received the letter from both Dr. Chen um, at the Department of Health, as well as, at the time, Rebecca Holcomb, um, Secretary of Education, simply laying out some bulleted points around the fact that, as a state, we don't have a, um, an explicit uh, curricula, if you will, around sex education under the uh, auspices of health education. You do know, of course, that health education has m many, um, uh, I'm not thinking of the word right now, uh, man mandates. So while a student is in, in uh, public education, they need to have access to comprehensive sex education. And one of those components is that uh, both birth control as well as so abstinence, birth control methods, uh, internal condoms, external condoms, dental dams, lubricants, uh, etc., cetera, um, are discussed in a health education class. But the problem and the reason why these students came forward to the policy committee is the fact that right now there is not a policy that says that as their health educator, or Peter Arsenault, the other health educator, that when a student then finishes a class where the learning target is, I can identify um, the benefits uh, to uh, safer sex practices. I don't think I've ever done that. I can demonstrate, but I will tell you that every, <laughs> well, you're laughing, but two of my, well, one of my former students in the room will tell you that, yes, thanks to the taxpayer's money, uh, in my, in my uh, closet there are eight uh, wooden dowels in the shape of penises. There's also plastic vulvas. Um, in which we, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't leave health education without, de without showing that you understand the process. You could do it through paper. If you're comfortable after I demonstrate or Peter demonstrates, after we watch some videos, um, you know, you teach the skill, you model the skill, you assess the skill, and the skill here is how do I show that I'm aware of safer sex practices? 
And so, you know, I've been here for six years. I've been teaching for 18. I've never been at a, in a school district that has had a policy. When I came here, um, Ben Heinz and mm, he's gone now, but another teacher, a social studies teacher, uh, in a Dem Roots class, students had elected to cover this. So this was seven years ago. And they made a wonderful video just Inter you know, they were interviewing uh, Kevin at the time, who was our uh, associate principal, assistant principal. They spoke to um, special ed. Uh, no, um, Tim, Tim. They spoke Tim. to Tim. They interviewed uh, the current health teacher at the time, Dan Gannon. They interviewed students. And they said, hey, why does U32 not have a condom policy? And it essentially ended with an ellipsis. And then I got hired. And I didn't find it. Uh, to be the most appropriate position to come out guns blazing my first year. So I came out my second year guns blazing. And I certainly am, I think I'm an advocate for my students. I think that my students can actually probably do a better job uh, than I can at, you know, is it 10 o'clock? It feels like midnight. Um, saying that we're taught this, this, these things, this is part of life that we all have. Sexual health is a part of our overall health. And Meg and Pete are showing us and teaching us the importance of abstinence and, and the importance of having making the decision uh, around your own sovereign right to um, be a sexual human being. The age of consent is 16 in the state of Vermont. Uh, the state of Vermont also does not have uh, an age in which a student needs to be to access uh, birth control methods. So. Just this evening, uh, parents of a sophomore said, why are you telling my, the, the funny thing is we're not in our sexual health unit yet, so it was great. Why are you telling my student that it's okay for her to access Planned Parenthood? Okay, and I'm not sure if I said that, but I per certainly had probably said that we have services in the area that can, students can access their uh, birth control forms. I can't legally, open up my closet where all of the external columns are located that we use on the phallic wooden penis models because the policy doesn't allow that. So when, and I, in six years I've lost count of the number of students. It's like, but Meg, there's one on the table, right? I'm not willing to put my job at risk to say, just take it, you'll be fine, because I want there to be more conversation. And I don't want that kiddo to take a, a, a free condom off my table it's up to them to have the conversation with the parents. What I simply want to do with this policy is make them accessible, but to, but to open this hot topic, this fairly politically charged topic, and, and to say, let's just start having conversations about sex with our children. Because these students, some of these students are electing to be active, whether we support it or not. The law tells our students that at age 16, they can legally make decisions around sex and their sexuality. Uh, the caveat is even 15, so the age of consent in the state of Vermont is 16, unless both parties are between the ages of 15 and 18. So we have some freshmen who, you know, are, are of age in which they can make those decisions. We might not as parents, and my children are three and six, so I'm not there yet, but we, we might not as parents agree with that decision, um, but if this is information that's being taught as comprehensively as I possibly can in one semester of health, for their entire high school career. I want to ensure, just like the math teacher that has the, you know, the calculators or the grafting, you know, that they can say, Meg or the nurses or the um, athletic director or, my, or the guidance staff have these things that then I can take and I can either use right this weekend, not right now, or I can say, you know, I'm not there yet, but I know that when I do get to that decision where I become uh, sexually active or I have my sexual debut, I'm getting rid of the word virginity in my classes, the sexual debut then allows them to say, I'm choosing to do this, I consent to this, and I know safer sex practices. And just like, you know, my parents want me to wear a winter jacket so that I don't get a cold, my parents also probably want to support using dental dams, condoms, and lubricant so that I can prevent unwanted pregnancy and I can prevent the spread of syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, which right now in the state of Vermont are at epic proportions. 
so it's education. I think one of the biggest things that came up through, I had more parent-teacher conferences this evening than I've ever had in 17 years of teaching, and every single one of them, the conversation came back to how do you talk to your kids? How do you talk to your kids about health? They were asking me, what are some methods? My 15-year-old hates me. I said, she'll get over it, and you will too, and you'll be okay. And, um, and some, con some questions at work came up about this policy, because they read it in uh, the Times Argus. And so I guess I'm simply here as an advocate to say some of our students are practicing safe sex currently. Uh, less than 50%. So the last youth risk behavior survey that we have, the data that we have, 7 through 12, indicates that less than 50% of our students identified as saying, yes, checkbox, I have had intercourse before. I have a problem with that question, of course, because you're not including all humans with all sexual preferences. So if we have uh, someone who identifies as homosexual, and they have had some form of sexual intimacy with another human in which bodily fluids were shared, that's not intercourse, but I still want to ensure that that student has the skills to prevent any spread of STI for unwanted pregnancy. I don't know if I'm going around in circles right now, and I can talk for hours, but I'm very tired, and I simply, I know that this is, a, clearly it's, a, it's an issue that, um, has been talked about since I've been here for six years. And um, I will just add one big thing, and that is, because I think a lot of folks turn to the, um, the what ifs. OK, Meg, so you just have yeah, a bowl. <coughs> you going Oprah style at the top of the atrium, right? You get a condom, you get, right? <laughs> no, none of those things. I, I'm OK with bowls. Bowls hold things. That's appropriate. Um, but the major, major piece is because they only have one semester of health education, and let's say they have me their sophomore year, and they're nowhere near socially, emotionally, physically, financially, but ready for this. And when they become 18-year-old seniors, they're like, oh, I remember this from health class, or I remember, and now I want to access those things. I can go do that. And even if I'm not choosing to be active, in the next four years, if I'm on my own in an apartment, if I'm in college, I can get those things and I can have them so that I can prevent you know, the cap, all of those things I've just discussed. Thank the you. component that's missing is education. And so it's, we, this can, we cannot do this in our silo. That's U32. We need to communicate to parents and community members. And we need to have evenings. Or I, I pitched at the policy committee that we have a streaming uh, an opportunity maybe once a month to have conversations around how do you, how do you talk to adolescents and emerging adults about um, healthy, happy sex lives? Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm Chris, what is your recommendation? Um, and we read the policy. Um, and there are, and so I just have a, one of the questions I have is, yeah. uh, Policy talks about um, that a, a minor student, a minor, has a legal right to uh, reproductive um, health right. um, services. Um, and so, do you have a spe specific statute in mind that supports that statement? And, and the reason I'm asking that is because. The statutory sites that are at the end of the policy, mm -hmm. um, and I think what you're referring to is 8, 18 BSA 422.6, mm -hmm. um, is not that not as broad as that statement is, at least in, in my reading. I think the the statute goes to um, if someone um, a minor mm -hmm. um, has um, deal issues with alcoholism, uh, drug issues, or venereal disease that they can seek medical treatment for those conditions and consent to it as a minor without parental involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is the limit of that statutory authority, mm -hmm. as I read it. Okay. It's not as broad as the policy language is, so I'd like to see if there's other um, statutory or other legal authority that is support for the, broad, for the broader statement that I see in this policy. You yeah, know, I certainly don't know the statute, I and mean, I, I can do I can do my research. Okay. I think um, 
I think what I can simply add to that, and, and certainly we'd have, I'd have to find it in writing, is just that students at any age in the state and can access it, can access testing, free testing, and free accessibility to, to contraceptives. And so I'll, I think I'm hearing you correctly. Am I, am I understanding what you're saying? You, you are, but, but just the way it was phrased, it almost gave it was like a legal right to um, access. Uh, and I just, I didn't see the statutory support for that proposition in, in the policy. Um, there, there is. Is there a law that denies that right? Not that I'm aware of. So the religious exemption. Right. Well, there's a it for it right. in, it in the yeah. absence of explicit statutory prevention of those rights or denial of those rights, can't we say that those rights exist? Um, you could probably say that at least the student could walk into a, a, a Walmart or a drugstore and purchase condoms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and I'm, you know, just like any other consumer. Um, so. Well, I just don't want to have um, policy misstate what the law is um, because I think that that part is unclear. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's my only point about it. And, in, and to cite something that really doesn't... No, I understand. The, yeah, so but the, but the text itself. It's an informational point that I'm trying to make, I think. Yeah. Um, there is um, an exemption uh, for religious um, convictions. Parent, parents with religious convictions can um, say, no, we don't want uh, my student to be uh, have access to condoms okay. in, or in, 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 the in here yeah. in the policy in, and in the law. And so but that, that is covered. But and it also applies to sex education. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's not just condoms. Yeah. It's a broader based um, religious exemption for parents who, who um, object. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I, I should just note that it's 945. And although we do not have a policy against torture of board members and administrators, I think I think our useful our, our useful span of time is, is the window is closing rapidly. So, so any, any comments that you want to send our way? Um, the only other um, suggestion I would make is there's two parts that talk about convictions. One includes the word religious conviction, the other just talks about convictions. I think it's just an omission. Um, because just in, in another part, I think that the religious convictions is well established here, um, but convictions on their own, I think not. Um, and I think that what I would want to do is also include a provision that basically directly informs parents of what the policy is and that they have this option an exemption option so that they're aware of they're aware of this information. But so so Chris, would would you be prepared to do a, a first reading and um, approve a first reading of C fifty? Um, given that you have or would you prefer to hold off on that until you can make more adjustments to okay. it? There'll be two readings. What? There'll be two readings. Yeah. yeah, we can do a first reading. Can you do a first that? reading? Yeah. 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 With with any well, have folks had enough time to review and comment? Where did it come from? As far as um, it came from um, it was sex. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, sex is yeah. just called argument to it. It's a it's a bi monthly uh, group that meets during our callback bands. But I meant actual no. writing of this policy. Oh, oh, so this oh policy. sure sure. So this policy is completely <laughs> lifted. Uh, so we got help from Andrea Nicoletta who's the head uh, education um, consultant at Planned Parenthood. Um, she sent us, well, there's, I think there's 12 or 13 uh, middle, uh, let's say high schools that currently have a condom accessibility policy. Uh, I'm uh, actually like, the, the, the term accessibility, I think Stephen and I, Stephen, we met with students probably a year and a half ago. And I think the term distribution and pulling the word distribution out of the policy and simply saying accessibility uh, changes everything. And so we elected, the students elected, to use the symbolist policy with four bullets. There's four bullet points. Um, we U32ified it, you know, and 
and that's what was proposed. <laughs> this policy that you're reading is actually a model from the state. The that's what I was wondering. Yeah, the from AOE, AOE or from yes. BSPA? AOE. AOE. Yeah. AOE model policy was published <clears throat> in January, February last year. That's just so you're, I'm not sure if you have Oh, no, they gave, so I have, yes, yeah, so we, uh, a, a cohort of sex educators, Got together because a lot of folks are in the same. We're in the we're in the same steps of the steps of that stage, and um, they gave us a variety of policies for us to peruse mm -hmm. and to figure out. You know, it's, at the end of the day, it's your policy, so figure out what's going to work for your own. Know your community, and then propose one that's going to work the best. Thank you. Yes, it is. May I ask if the board is interested in allowing the first reading of the? Of the other two policies, the board yeah. for conflict of interest and the library media? I, I would, unless there's controversy about either one of those, which I don't really expect. Should we, right. Um, should we just move to approve them for the on first block? Reading. First reading. For the first reading. Before we do that, I would like to say thank you for the work you did yeah, and yeah. all the information you gave us. I am totally on board with that, and I think that this is a great thing to be putting into policy. Good. All right. I'm ready for a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the first reading of the three policies that's presented. Okay. Very good. Floor moves. All second. Dorothy seconds. Very good. Any further discussion? <laughs> <laughs> right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed. Great. Should we tell you which one? Library? Do you know which? I it's the three that are listed, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we come to a fork in the road yet again. Um, it's so late. Uh, it feels good. Right. We did our homework. I, mean, we did our I know. We did our homework. Um, the, uh, we, can, we can expand on it. Um, would you be willing, Flora, if we, because do you think we can have a, a quality discussion at this point? It, no, yeah. Um, Not right now? No. Yeah. 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 All right. So everybody's there. We have, you know, you have to drive a long way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We are getting through the book. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're not going to forget about the book. And no, we are going to forget that. about it. Has, has anybody read all of everybody else's comments? Because I have not. I have not. And I think that that would be very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. And if anyone didn't get a chance, send them, you can send them a couple. to me and I'll resend them back out. Okay. okay. Very good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, seven board organizers. Oh, oh, at this point. I, as the administrators look at me expectantly, <laughs> um, yes, oh. by all means. You sure? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hand you guys a couple of the resources that we mentioned. I have all those. <laughs> Um, everybody is reminded of the community mapping project? Yeah. Great. Um, personnel, action. Um, approved hires. We have, are, are these, can we approve these also uh, as a batch? Were there? Yes, I have one addition that was in your handout. Yes. May I just mention them by name? Please. Okay. So first of all, um, including the one that was added this evening, um, yeah. Julie McKinstry to uh, 
um, an additional 0.5 as teacher. This is in relation to the grant from the Title I school improvement that we discussed last time. We received approval today. Yay. So we can now proceed with them making this recommendation um, for Julie. So I'll show you this video just quickly and then you can address them as a group. Yes? Yes. Okay. So the others, um, we have a uh, long-term South Fernando uh, Carbone Bookstop for social studies here at U32. Um, are we any uh, school counselor long-term sub at U32? Alan Heffernan, a social studies long-term sub. And then last but not least, Lisa Hodgson, who is going to be taking on the 0.5 third grade position that we discussed in our last meeting. Um, Lisa is currently employed as a half-time special educator at Callis, and this will round her position out to full-time and is a recommendation of our um, administration uh, to bring her on for that purpose. Wonderful. So this gets back to the 20 additional students we discussed in our last meeting yes. and the need to expand our, uh, our teaching staff. Okay. Wonderful. That's yes. It. Um, do we have a motion to approve the hiring of these individuals, as mentioned. I, I make a motion. Lindy moves. I second. Jael seconds. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? Is, is it, why, why is it per diem to this contract price? Sure. It is a per diem of the contract. Mm -hmm. And whenever we look at a long-term sub, mm -hmm. in particular, um, we just pay them by the number of days that they're with us. And if a person happens to return early or say later, we have the flexibility to pay them for the days they actually work, or if they may become ill and can't work the entire time. Um, but it is based on the salaries that are articulated in that teacher. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions? Can I ask a question to the people who have been on school boards before? Have you ever had a, a situation like this where something came up and in the board discussion something bad was found or in conversation it was decided not to approve the hire? It's never happened yeah. to me. Thank you. Yeah. There has been better. There's we have gone into executive session and have great mm -hmm. conversations about the hospital concerns. And I was just going to say, they're so well vetted. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's going through yeah. so many yeah. steps. Can, can I ask what, as broadly as you can, what the concern was? I assume in I've had it come up in another school district, and it was someone who had knowledge of, and in executive session said, I saw this or I read about this, and they vetted it and found out it was no cause in the end, but you know how people can be splashed in the paper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it had come back that it was not substantiated and the superintendent had yeah. done mm -hmm. all of that background check. Yep. Good. Anything else? Yep. Okay. All in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Very good. We'll make a motion to go into the second session. May I first mention um, how happy we are that the vote um, was successful yesterday. I know I sent you all notes about it, uh, and I've also sent a note to David, so it will be incorporated into an article. But thank you to the community for coming forward and you know, very, very positively supporting the article amendments that we need for our operation. Yeah, and for the, the, the clear, concise, and cogent no, article that was in the New York, in the, in the Times Artist, yeah. and that's up there. <laughs> the yes. uh, do you still want to go into yes. executive session, Bubba? Okay. Motion to go into executive session? I'll make a motion to go into executive session. Thank you, Flora. Second. second. Lindy seconds. Very good. I'll go to the door. Yeah, <laughs> two doors. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.